Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, day two of uh, this hearing. I'll just, <coughs> excuse me, because we've got a couple of new parties that weren't here yesterday, I just want to spend just a couple of seconds on a few housekeeping matters. And I will ask everybody in the, in the room, including the panel to introduce themselves so everybody knows who's who. Um, just by way of background, for those people that are new to this process or haven't made submissions before or are feeling a bit nervous, the simple message is please, please don't. We're simply here to hear what you've got to tell us. Um, if we don't quite understand or we want you to clarify something for us, we'll ask. There's no trick questions. Um, we're, we're simply here to get to the, to the nitty gritty of what it is you want and uh, to understand why. I should also say that we have read all the submissions, the evidence, the rebuttal evidence, the hearings presentations, the summary statements. In other words, everything that's been provided, we have read. So we're not anticipating, and it's not helpful to us for mm -hmm. people to read vast chunks of that written material. We are asking them to present an up to approximately 10 minutes highlights package of what they're uh, seeking and to focus on that rather than a, a whole screed of, of background because we have read that. So I'll now just very quickly ask the panel to introduce themselves. I'll start with myself, I suppose. Uh, my name's Phil Mitchell, I'm <coughs> chairing uh, the hearings panel. I'll just ask the panel to do likewise and then we'll just carry on around the rest of the room, please. Dan Sedgwick, I'm a Waikato District Councillor and I'm appointed as an independent commissioner. Hello, um, I'm Diane Fulton. I'm an uh, independent commissioner, but a former council on the Waikato District Council. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, Janet Gibb, I'm a current uh, Waikato District Councillor and appointed as an independent commissioner. And at this point, I'll just mention um, as per the the list on the website for conflicts of interest. I have a conflict with the Metcalf submission and so I will take no part in that um, discussion. Thank you. Morning, Nakoto. Well, Marg, Independent Commissioner. I'm Paul Kearney, um, Independent Commissioner, Deputy Chair, a lawyer. All right, that's the panel. Let's um, just go around the rest of the room. We don't need to do it in any particular order. Council staff or submitters, um, we don't mind. Just so that we know who's on the call. Uh, I'm Justine Ashley. Um, I'm the author of the 42A report for uh, Ngāhawahia, Hauratū and Tāpiri. And uh, jo Jonathan Cleese, um, 42A officer uh, reporting on to Kofi. Thank you both. Evan Holbrook. Planner for uh, Greg Metcalf. Thanks, Mr. Holbrook. Okay. Morning, or oops, sorry. Sorry. No, no, you go. It's all good. Uh, Kate Barry Pacino, barrister for Perry Group. Yes, morning. Morning, all. Fletcher, um, Fletcher Bell for Waikato District Council, um, hearings coordinator. Uh, good morning. Sorry. I'm a submitter. Thanks, Mr. Upton. Welcome. Hi. Um... <laughs> Where you go? Good. Yeah. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm Mark Delacour. Um, I'm the owner of 46 Jackson Street. Thank you very much. That's Mark Arbuthnot here. I am just observing reports of Auckland. Thanks, Mr. Arbuthnot. Marshall Stead, I will be submitting after morning tea today. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Aaron Collier for uh, Perry Group. Thanks, Mr. Collier. Uh, Steve Roberts, I was a submitter yesterday. Thanks, Mr. Roberts. Morena Kato, I'm Carolyn Rett, uh, assisting Waikato District Council. Lindsay Sheck on behalf of Sheck Family Trust. 
Thank you very much. I believe Ms Kelly for Council of Step has just currently stepped out for a bit. All right, and we see there's a couple of other observers from the council there. All right, look, well, let's, let's get cracking. Um, what I would ask submitters to do is that when you're not actively speaking, if you could turn your microphone off and your video off, um, that way we don't get um, feedback and um, use up the bandwidth and so forth, but the process does work pretty effectively. Um, so, Mr. Upton, Mr. Eccles, and Mr. Mansur, please. Welcome. Thank you. My name's Simon Upton. I'm making this submission as a landowner and ratepayer. My family has lived in these parts, uh, in what used to be the Raglan County, actually, since before the land wars of the 1860s. The farm I currently live on has been in the family for uh, 80 years. I'm the third generation at Wedi Farm. I first went to school in Narawahia. I worked at the Horatu Freezing Works as a student. And if anyone asks me where I'm from, I say Narawahia, which overseas causes a spelling problem. I know every inch of the land around where I live. And I'd just like to share with you a photo taken uh, probably in the 1950s, um, looking out towards the Waipa from where I now live, um, we seem to have host disabled participant screen sharing. No, we can rectify that very quickly. You should be able to screen share now. There you go. Uh, don't worry, I won't. I won't. Yeah. I won't give you millions of these, but I thought this was interesting. Taken in the mid 1950s, looking out towards the Waipa river from where I now live, but it's still very recognizable. I'd like to say that's me, but it's not. It's my long deceased brother. Okay. My Looks like he's peeing about... on an electric fence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it, something's happened to fencing technology in the meantime. You can see it was a sheep farm because there's wool on that bottom barbed wire. <laughs> but anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> my submission is about where and how Nauruwa here should expand. In 20 years, I'm likely to be dead and gone. So what I'm talking about won't affect me, but it will affect future generations. The question is, are they going to live in Narawa here or just some urban sprawl to the north of a big city? Now, I've got three principal concerns I want to talk to you about today. First, the preservation of Narawa here's distinct physical identity. Secondly, the need for a town boundary that respects the topography and drainage of the landscape. And thirdly, the need to keep intensive residential development and farming operations separated. Now, because there are so many national, regional and local documents that we all have to take account of, I've asked a couple of experts to help me ensure that my propositions are ones that meet the rules. So I'll make some brief comments and then hand over to uh, Mr. Eccles and Mr. Mansurg to address some specific planning points. My first point concerns Narawahia. Narawahia has its own distinct bicultural identity. I think it's worth preserving. In its 50 year plan, Waikato 2070, the council talks about ensuring Narawahia doesn't become a dormitory suburb for Hamilton. Future proof talks about preserving the identity of towns through denser forms. But the proposed plan moves Narawa here another step closer to Horatu and to Hamilton. Just one farm and the golf course reserve separate Salbury Road from Horatu. The plan would move the town boundary very close to a point of no return. So, you cannot decide any southern boundary extension to this town and see it as just an incremental step. Either you are deciding on a final southern boundary or you are opening the way to an unbroken urban expanse that eventually joins Narawa here to Hamilton. In my view, the proposed residential strip between the railway and my farm is just another form of ribbon development. Some of it sits on really good, well-drained horticultural soil, which is what it's being used for now. Much of the rest is pretty wet. 
I know because my flats, which adjoin this area, are really wet. The proposed extension boundaries look as though they have been chosen to line up with people who want to sell and subdivide, not with planning principles. How else can we explain the strange north-south zone boundary on the structure plan that stops in the middle of the flat south of the current Newcastle subdivision? Now, I, I actually supported that extension, but logically all the land west of Rangimariye Road, uh, the paper form of Rangimariye Road, uh, and above the flood zone or gully uh, should be proposed for residential. I'll let Mr. Eccles and Mr. Mansu expand on the planning coherence of the proposed residential zone boundary. Mr. Upton, I'm, I'm, Mr. Upton I, I, don't want, I don't want to interfere, um, interrupt you, but can we, can we have a, a plan up of, of your property and the, the locality? I think it'll be very helpful to, for us to get that dimension as, you, as you're speaking. Is that possible? Yes, we can. We can. Mr. Mr. Eckel, Mr. Mansurg is going to come to that, but but if you want, I can to see I can I can share his evidence. There's a few figures in his evidence that might be might be useful. I, I'll yeah, that was the one I was going to share. There we go. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's just the, the I'm sorry, the, the, the line that I'm talking about, the north south line, which is, seems very strange to me, is this one here. You see where the mouse is going down. Now? Yeah, I mean, logically, if you're going to put this into houses, and I think that makes sense because it joins on to Narawa here today, why not put the other stuff in? I, 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 there's no planning reason why you would draw that line. Um, and what you'll be hearing from, uh, from us as we go through this is the fact that that is a very sensible line, that gully line, why not use that all the way around? But I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but if you wanted to know what that line was, uh, Paul, that's that's it. Okay, um, thanks. That, that's helpful. We take that in context. I think Mr. Allen from yesterday is in the property um, immediately below where Mr. Upton was showing the other side of the road. Maybe Mr. Upton can just put his mouse on it. The, the, the Allen property. Yes, the the, the Allen yeah. property is there. Yep. And Mr. Allen is currently covering that, but in houses there. Uh, that was the plan change 17, which again, I supported. I think it makes good sense, good use of the land. It abuts the town, as does this bit here. Um, I, but the, the purpose of this is just to point out to you that the, the boundaries don't always seem to be aligned with what you'd think was a sensible planning or topographical or environmental. That, that one, it seems to me that all of this could eventually become part of Narawahi if that if, if expansion to the south is is what's talked about. So, as I say, I'll let Mr. Eccles and Mr. Mansurg uh, expand on the uh, on the planning coherence of this because I'm not a planner; it's not my expertise. Um, if I can, um, should we take that down? Because it, yeah, because I've, I've got me coming before that. My, my, my second point. So that was the first one. Narawa here. Do you join it on the Hamilton? Second point concerns the proposed town boundary. I consider that any southern extension of the residential zone should not cross the gully and drainage system. The stream that formed the gully system that ends in the Waipa River is a really important physical asset that is the logical southern boundary for the town. My farm embraces the last two wetland gully systems that enter the Waipa before it joins the Waikato. Both of them have been seriously modified, but they are salvageable. The government now requires everyone to have regard to te mana o te wai. And in the spirit of that, I have embarked on a massive uh, project to restore those elements in my ownership. I'm currently working on the one on the south side. This is going to take me the rest of my life. Uh, we know though that Māori used the stream for kai. I'd just like to share this photo with you because it really does emphasize um, how this land has been lived in. Um, a beautiful, perfectly preserved hinaki was recovered from the bottom of the wetland uh, uh, on my property, just further down in 1993. 
It's now in the hands of Waikatu Tainui, who uh, kindly allowed me to share this photo uh, with you. Uh, it's just one piece of evidence of the fact that this is a stream, a living waterway, and, and they were harvesting uh, tuna uh, eels here. By proposing to push a road and subdivision across the gully system as though it wasn't even there, the plan ignores the fundamental drainage pattern of the land. And I'm just amazed we're still doing this in 2021. But furthermore, this gully is a flood hazard zone that extends all the way to Havelock Hill. Uh, and it's marked as such on Plan 20.7, which council staff can give you. It goes all the way right through to Havelock Hill. So beyond my property, uh, into the Allens property beyond. Now look, I was born during the 1958 flood. Obviously, I don't remember that, but people have short memories. With the wrong weather at the wrong time, the water will back up all the way. I've seen it in my lifetime. The idea that you just harden up the landscape and put roads and culverts through it is contrary to everything the regional council is saying about gully systems and more recently wetlands and their importance. And everything we know about the more extreme rain events climate change is bringing with it. The fact that we've turned the stream into a drain doesn't change the fact that it's a water course. So I'd say to commissioners, whatever you do, there should be no development in the lower wet zone, which follows the drain beyond Havelock Hill to the flats between my hills and the railway line. I'm particularly concerned because I actually own two chunks of the gully further down and I receive everyone's water. So if it's all hardened up with asphalt and concrete, it's got to go somewhere. Finally, on my third point, I'll be very brief. I simply want to observe that my home is a working farm of about 200 acres on both sides of Sawbury Road. It's run as a single unit. The gully and the current lifestyle blocks create a suitable transition buffer. It's worked well. I'm not opposed to development per se, but bringing intensive housing without any transitional zone whack alongside a livestock farm really worries me. And that's even with the correction to the town boundary, which the council apparently agrees with. Very finally, I want to underline to you that the arguments I've made to you are not to my financial advantage probably the contrary. But I believe the result would be better for Narawahia and its future residents. Now I'm going to hand over to Mr. Eccles and to Mr. Mansug and then to Mr. Eccles. So we'll just have to do a bit of a changing. We'll, we'll wait till the end, I think, and we'll, we'll ask any questions from the group as a whole. That way we um, get the full picture first and the best person to answer can do so. So thank you, Mr. Mansur, which is when you're ready, thanks. Thanks, sir, uh, commissioners. Um, what I'm going to speak very briefly about is really the landscape justifications for uh, in support of running the zone boundary around a landscape uh, topographical feature rather than um, a probably a cadastral feature as the proposed district plan. I'll just bring up uh, share a screen and bring up um, a sorry, drive this at the same time. What we're looking at here is a weighted analysis, um, which was undertaken as part of a report prepared for uh, by myself for the district council looking at landscape suitability for development. And the purpose of that was to support the um, the Section 32 analysis um, a couple of years back. What this shows is from a landscape and visually effects perspective, areas which are at a higher level, more suitable and less suitable for urbanisation, um, looking at a number of factors, including how to contain Narawahia as an entity in itself, how to prevent what I'll term rural sprawl, which is moving out into the rural landscape, noting that part of the district plan, of course, has provisions that look at the uh, maintenance of rural amenity and rural character. 
what we can see here is, is areas where there is uh, less suitable for development as shown in red, which is the higher, more elevated hill countries, which have greater visibility issues. Also the gully wetlands, which have, of course, some uh, construction difficulty issues and more suitable areas in green, which tend to be the flatter land. What this has led to, and this map is probably slightly clearer because we're showing the elevation in the background, it is some very clear and distinct topographical features which form logical edges um, to development and prevent um, uh, future issues which the vehicles will discuss shortly. The yellow, of course, shows the proposed zone, and the pink line shows the uh, amendments that I support from a landscape and visual effects perspective. Mr. Mansug, um, the Mr. Upton's land, can you show it there? Mr. Upton's land is again here. No, no, sorry. sorry. My boundary goes like this. Okay. And, and then down Silvery Road. And and Mr. Allen's and uh, prop, Mr. Allen's property. Okay. Uh, and then and Mr. Th and Mr. Dillatour's property is this one here. Oh, good. Yeah, OK. Thank you. I'll hand you over to Mr. Eccles. Thank you, Mr. Manser. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and um, morning. commissioners. Um, so I just want to start with um, uh, I am worried, as you've probably picked up through my various bits of evidence, that um, what's happened here is a draping of a zone over um, sort of largely based on property boundaries and so on and so forth, um, based on some work that was done, um, obviously, during the, the structure plan in 2017. Um, my worry is that it's not quite that simple in this locality especially with the advent of the NPS for freshwater management in September last year, and the effect it has on the ability to um, design and install infrastructure to be able to service subdivision and development. It's very directive in terms of avoiding effects on wetlands. And I say this from a position of experience, the company I work for, TNT, we have a large waters area, we're constantly working in the water space. Um, the assumption that you can design your way out, design your way out of constraints or around constraints in terms of wetlands, gullies, waterways later at the subdivision stage um, with the advent of the NPS um, nine odd months ago um, is now very challenging. And we've had situations similar to this in other parts of the country where zoning is in place, you can't get the regional consents to get the infrastructure in. Now, um, the structure plan has a road running basically along here to service this land. Um, if any of this is wetland, um, if it's gully, if it's waterway, the ability to get regional consents and so on in. Um, will be very challenging and potentially problematic. Um, that is informing my view that the gully edge is the appropriate place for the boundary, because I think there's a risk that you go zoning it, but you can't actually develop it because of those constraints. And that's a very real risk. And, you know, it's something that's come along um, relatively recently and is very directive. Um, the, uh, Mr. Upton's talked to you about the reverse sensitivity risk with a farm with houses over the fence and so on. 
if you were still minded to be zoning in here, I think there's a there's a case for a, a setback um, to deal with reverse sensitivity along that along that boundary. Um, the other thing I just want to point out is that I am currently involved for council. There is environment court proceedings associated with a consent review for a site over here, which was zoned. Um, it's quite apparent that there are elevated cultural um, importance levels in this wider area associated with Pukiahua or Havelock Hill. Um, this is now an environment court proceedings after the consent was uh, cancelled by the commissioner. Um, and those values need to be borne in mind. Um, there is, I think, a worry and a worry that we might lose a bit of yield if you follow the zoning that we are that we are supporting. Uh, my my view is that that yield that may be lost here would be um, taken up somewhere else or offset somewhere else in Natawahia. I know there's a recommendation to approve Kaing Aura's medium density residential zone. I know Mr Davies' latest report said that council's got a number of plan changes and variations lined up elsewhere that'll help. Um, this conundrum that council's in in terms of trying to find enough land to put houses on to meet the MTSUD. Um, but in this case, I think you need to respect the topography, the drainage matters and so on that the NPS for freshwater also um, imposes. Um, just lastly, you may ask, um, you may ask, well, why, why should you worry about this hill country area or this, these landscape units that Mr Mansu talked about? Because they're not section six ONFLs, they're not the Huck of the Martyrs or, or anything like that but they are features of local amenity significance. And you have got, you know, objectives in your district plan that talk about maintaining rural character and amenity and so on. And you've got section seven amenity and quality environment matters as well. Um, just to finish, the, um, the worry about Narawatiya bleeding into Horatu and then becoming part of Hamilton, um, I think is a fair one. Um, and I suppose I just note that Hamilton City um, spoke to you about this, I think yesterday or the day before, and in their evidence through Laura Galt, they are concerned about it um, as well. So, you know, what I'm saying here is there's some site-specific stuff that needs to be thought about, and it's not quite as simple as just draping a zoning over the top of it all. Thanks very much. That's all. Oh, thank you. I saw I saw from your body language that I thought you'd finished. I didn't mean to preempt it though. So you are finished. Thank you. Let's see if there's um, let's see if there's any questions from the panel. I think we'll just ask them to the three of you and whoever you feel is most appropriate to answer. Then that's fine with us. Yeah. We we might just have to leave it to save musical cheers as long as you can hear the answer. Is that all right, sir? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. If we can't hear, we'll sing out. Yeah. Let's start with you, Ms. Cedric, please. Um, thank you very much uh, for your presentations. Just on the uh, question of the rather lovely um, hinaki that you found there, um, have there been any other artifacts found or has there been any other investigation around your site uh, to indicate that there might be anything of cultural significance? I don't know whether there's been <clears throat> other investigations. I mean, the council, I think, has conducted archeological investigations um, but I mean, the people one should really talk to Amari here. I took the trouble to do that actually years ago when I was writing an article about living here. And I had one of, uh, Hari Puki put me onto uh, one of the elders and I had him up to my hill and I said, look, if you look out over the country here, what would you have seen 200 years ago? And his answer was, look, uh, yeah, yeah there'd have been kaikateas and the swamp and the, there'd been a lot of bracken but he said there'd been a lot of clearings because this is where a lot of uh, a, a lot of stuff was grown uh, a lot of kumara was grown uh, and and you know the, the borrow pits all through i mean the the, the the reports show they go well to the south towards Tikopa. this was an intensively lived in place now 
you know, it's just, it's worth knowing that. Um, obviously, we can't turn the clock back on what has happened, <coughs> but it's the living bits, I think, which matter. And, and the, that water course, the Hinaki is proof of a living water system. And uh, that actually means more to me uh, than anything. Uh, and I think we've got to do everything we can to try to get those back into better shape. So I'm, I'm doing my bit there. Thank you. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Ms. Gill? Um, yes, thank you. I'm just wondering if you can explain to me about the comment, uh, the gully or the stream was turned into a drain and whether that drain, which apparently is looked after by the regional council, goes all the way to the Waipa River or whether it's only a portion of the stream. No, no, the whole, the whole wetland got, 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 got uh, drained. I mean, they drained everything a few years ago. You'll find um, that drain goes up uh, through a culvert underneath the Narawahia Road. Uh, and, you know, from time to time, there's drain clearage going, going back up. And then the drain continues all the way around Havelock Hill, and it goes around, it crosses Sorby Road. In fact, there's, there's two feet of drains. There's one there and there's one to the right. Uh, and as far as I know, that goes across farms right back up towards Horatu. So it's quite a little catchment that goes through there. Um, uh, as, and as I say, I mean, it's, it's all very well having a drain, but when it floods, it floods. It's, it's, just, it's wall to wall right through that gully. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor. If I might just add something, I suppose, um, under the NPS for freshwater, um, what for all intents and purposes might look like a drain, <laughs> as we're finding, um, or might not look like a wetland or whatever, um, is still captured. Um, and so, you know, there's still the potential for a lot of fish hooks here in terms of that wetland slash gully network and drainage network. Um, thank you. And I was interested in the graduated scale from green to bright red <laughs> um, to do with the, the suitability of the land um, and I'm assuming that even if it's on a, only a, a light yellowy orangey colour that still gets flooded as you say with uh, with high weather, weather events or whatever so um, you are obviously not wanting any of that yellowy orangey ready bits to to be um, housing because of the whole gully system is that am I getting that right that's what you're saying Yes, what, what we're um, suggesting is that this pink line with the hatch is the more suitable lands from a landscape perspective, but, uh, as well as the planning and um, infrastructure development arguments that um, Mr. Eccles has put up. Um, just, just to your point there that this plan is showing topography, this one is showing the suitability. So okay. there's, um, the, the, there's less suitable sort of running right up in here, particularly in, in this area, and I'll just flick between the two. That because there's this is the sort of the headwater wetland seepage before the gully really starts to take form running down through here. And the um, the flood zone, um, as you can see in the 20.7 map, runs all the way up into this area here. There. Okay, thanks very much. That's all my questions. Sorry, thanks, Ms. Gibb. Mr. Mark? Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Just referring back to the drains that you've shown us on the map, are you able to identify whether they're man-made or were they natural? Well, drains, are, as I understand it, are made by people. Yes. They're, not, they're, they're, not, they're not natural. So, so when these drains were made, they were made for the purposes of protecting from flooding? They were, <clears throat> well, no, they wouldn't provide protection from flooding, certainly not down here because it's far too low. Okay. Uh, I, look, I assume, I, I don't know, this is all predates, this is all my great uncle's time or earlier. I assume that it was the classic thing, you know, the pioneers got in there, they wanted to get every, every blade of grass, and they put the cars down in the bottom of the gully, you know. <laughs> The, the more you could, the more you could get into grass, the more you do. I, I, I think it's when those days have gone. I mean, you, if you, today, if you tried to do that, you'd get stopped before you started. But this is the, this is the inheritance of, of what we're living with, which is why the Waikato River Authority 
is working with landowners all through here to try to get some of this back. And there's still a lot of native grass in the bottom of, of, of uh, the, 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 the gully. Um, that's on the left-hand side of your picture. Um, the drains are, 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 are you know, they're, they're fenced, but this is a it's much shallower here. The, the, as um, Mr. Eccles says, the gully starts to take form around here, um, and 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 gets deeper and deeper as it goes down. Um, so yeah, but it, no drain, <laughs> drains. I've never heard of a drain happening naturally. The drain is mm -hmm. done by a guy with a digger. <laughs> Yeah, so let's get back to the gully itself and the health of the gully or the street that you refer to where you're wanting to do the restoration work. What is the current health of relation to Mahinakai? Has any study been done? Well, I, I know I, I, I know there are eels in here and I'm mainly working at this stage because of this plan change, I haven't actually done, I've done a little bit over here, um, a little bit over here, sorry, over there. I own that bit there, but most of my work's happening on the south side of Salbury Road at present. But the, I can't tell you what the health of the Mahinga Kai is. Um, I can tell you that there is quite a lot of native grass through here, um, but it needs, it, it needs a lot of planting and tidying up. Now, the one thing I would say, if you're interested in living things, I have created a, um, a pond here, or it's been there for a very long time, but we've done, I'm, I'm currently working on this bit of the wetland and this bit here. We've actually got uh, breeding dab chicks on these two. Um, and but it's not, I just say that because this is a place where life, the native life is coming back to. And again, I think that could be a real asset for Naroa here in the future. If you've got an area here which is living, and it's got some, some, some native life on it. So I think that's good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fulton. Um, thank you. Yes, without having done a site visit, it's um, um, we're getting an understanding from what you're telling us, but I think probably we would probably need to go and have a look. Oh, I certainly would anyway. Um, and we did see very clearly yesterday uh, and the evidence was very much like just an ordinary drain that had been dug straight. So. Uh, and was inferred during the hearing that it, all it needed was a bridge across it. But uh, you put a different perspective on it this morning. Just the um, the, high, the higher land is is it? Um, how difficult is that to build on? Is it going to be an area where it's um, 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 bigger sections required to to house, or is it? A, will it change from being a, a closely residential block to a um, Bigger block required in the in this whole in the whole area. Um, putting on the designer hat, the steeper lands up through here do present um, some issues. Building platforms or pole development could occur, but probably the um, the bigger problem would be getting vehicle access up and down. It would create sort of cuttings and retaining requirements potentially that that. Um, essentially mean that you do need bigger lots to be able to manoeuvre some of the things that you, on the flat can get tighter um, or smaller lots because you, you can um, more easily deal with turning etc and access to the sites. There's also the issue of course that you've got to cut, you've got to, to gain access uh, potentially with the road coming through here you've got quite a reasonably steep uh, incline coming up and you've also got two yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so I think in that in that high ground that you're talking about councillor like, yep. and and here I appreciate that the council grappling with where to put houses right you've got to find enough space to, to put houses. Could could you build a a density on that? Um Yes, I don't think residential sort of 450 square metre densities as proposed is it. <laughs> um, could it be lower density? I don't know, village zoning, something like that density, mm. perhaps. I still have a worry about how you get to it and whether you can get the consents to get to it um, over the scully system. If any of this ends up being wetland, and in order to sort this out, you need to have an ecologist tell you. But if any of this ends up being called wetland under the NPS, 
or a waterway and so on, the ability to get access through there will become very, very difficult, if not impossible. And can I just add that, that, that if uh, the structure plan as, as proposed was to proceed and a road was to go right along, cut through here, then you are actually crossing, you're crossing a wet drained, drained area here, but then you're crossing the gully again. So you, the major piece of infrastructure going through this wetland, the, the, through the wet area twice. And I assume you've got to bring other infrastructure in through there too. So this is quite a major intervention uh, if, if you do it as the, the, as the, um, the structure plan proposes. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Appreciate that. Mr. Kenny. It's not a bit like Mr. Fulton. I think um, I know myself, I'd need to go out there and have a look. But um, there was an aerial photo that was up yesterday. Can we put that up? And um, if someone can just describe the wet area and the drain, I think the photograph showed the, the actual um, drain area. So is that possible? So what was it? What was the address? Sorry. If you go to any of the addresses that are relevant to this, I'd suggest you go maybe um, try eighty six Salbury Road. It'll get you in the. It'll get you in the ballpark. Salbury spell S O S A U L. S A U L Salbury Road. Got it. B R E Y. One second. Can everyone see that? Not yet. Now we can. If we can have the um, the aerial photograph overlay, though, not the get all the. Hang on, you need to come. You need to come. Which way are we looking? You've got a. Salbury Road. Yeah, you you need to blow up. The, I can't get, move your cursor up. About there, you need to expand that sort of general area, and then we can move it around a bit from there. Maybe blow it up a little bit more. No, other way. Ah. <laughs> I think even make it bigger and get, yeah, make it bigger. So. Yeah, there we are. That's starting to make sense. Uh, bring it up more. Quick now. <clears throat> Hey, okay, does, does someone want to just explain where the gully system is and the ridge line and that? It'll give us an idea. Yeah. Well, we can we can do it with the cursor, but I mean, if, yeah. if the, the, the clearest the clearest okay. picture you've got is on plan twenty point seven, which shows flood zone going up here. Like, I, have to cursor, I, think. I can oh, bring I can up the flood the zone. Cursor. I don't think we can see your cursor, Mr. Upton, because you haven't got control of the screen. It's your photo, yes, yes, yes. If, if, you, if, you, put, if you were to put plan 20.7 up Ngārawa here south, then well, Fletcher's got that. I sent it through to him, actually. I'll put it up. Uh, can... That's it. There you are. That's it. So that tells you where the flood zone goes to. And, of course, the, the, you know, the drain at the end of that pink tip then comes back towards Sawberry Road. But, but as far as Havelock Hill, it's in it's in your hazard zone. Um, Sir, if it's any, if it's any assistance, um, when I started assisting Mr. Up tonight to go out there and, and have a look, because trying to do it off plans gets very difficult. Oh, I, I don't think we're trying to make any final determination by looking at some maps. I, I want to stress that. I think all we're trying to do is while you're here, get as much information about the areas that you're referring us to and so on and so forth. So that when we do go and have a look, we've we've at least had the benefit of that input from you. So can we go back to the aerial map? Photo, yeah. So the, that's the gully area there, yeah. That's great, yeah. And it goes on right through to the top of the picture. Yeah. That's right. And and the topography you want the line drawn is up on the hills there, just to the left. Yeah. I'm just following the the north side of the gully. Um, that's that seems to me to be the logical 
one to go for. Okay. So that then does leave the hills out. Now, you know, as you've heard the two experts say, you can, you could build on the hills. They're not they're not all steep. There are some steep bits, but you've then got an access problem. Um, so the sort of building you do and the density would be another matter. Um, but however you do it, you're going to have to go across, and the structure plan is proposing to cross that wetland. And I can tell you that bit, the pink bit sticking up, is, that's really it's quite steep and quite wet through there. Yeah, and thank you, Fletcher. That was well done. That, that gives a good idea there. Yeah. Um, Mr. Upton, the other thing is, uh, from my memory, you were um, at, at an earlier hearing looking at the ability to create um, move, move titles round and create a hamlet situation. Is that a, is that on that property or across the road? Uh, it's on it's on both properties. I mean, the, the the farmers on both sides of the road. But again. You know, I, I think that, sh that sort of thing should only happen if you can tuck it away in the landscape where, it, where it's going to cause the least disruption. I, you know, it's, it's, it's an option which I think would be useful um, for, for landowners like myself who do have a number of titles. But, but you know, the, the, the aim should be <laughs> to achieve something which fits the landscape rather than something which is plopped on top of it. And that's really... You know, my big problem with what's proposed with, with, with the, the structure plan and the district plan is it's just plonking something on the landscape. It's not looking at it and saying, how can we keep the water, the, 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 the drainage and the water system intact? How can we keep the best bits of the topography? How can we make the houses fit with it? And, and unfortunately, what I seem to gather is that people are saying, oh, well, um, don't worry, after the, the, there'll be more work to be done. This will happen after. I think you can't zone until you see what it looks like. You know, there's a, I, I was, if you look at the structure plan, there's a dotted line. So it says green link. I mean, you can't have a dotted line. A, the green link is obviously the gully, but that requires a bit of work. I, I just think there's more work needed to be done to make the best use of the land. Thank you. Um, Mr. Eccles, um, then what you mentioned about the difficulty over what is a wetland, isn't the government really looking at that definition of wetlands at the moment? Yeah, there's been some, there's a draft guidance document that was issued uh, probably a month or six weeks ago now. Um, and it actually... Um, <laughs> made life more difficult in the wetland space <laughs> by, by introducing a status called an induced wetland. So we now have naturally occurring wetlands, we have induced wetlands and, and artificially constructed wetlands. Um, that, that, that document has been the subject of much comment. This is a very, very difficult space for the profession at the moment. But what I can say is that um, this just looks like a case to me, like what's happening around the rest of the country that um, could pose some serious difficulties. All right, Th thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Just a couple from me, please. Um, the first one just follows on from that. I, I think I'd agree with you, Mr. Eccles, in terms of the NPSFM and the guidance document and, and so forth. And it's created some fundamentally challenging issues looking forward. Um, I suppose the, the question though, and it may, may or may not be the, you that can answer this, but it might be Mr. Upton. Has, has anyone actually looked at this piece of land from the perspective of the NPSFM? I mean, it's one thing to say, I'm worried about it. It's yeah. another thing to say, well, I'm 95% confident that areas one, two, three, four, and five fall foul of the definition of, of natural wetland? No, we haven't. There hasn't been an ecologist, a freshwater ecologist, or the right sort of ecologist go out there and assess any of this area. And I wouldn't confine it just to the Upton property. Um, I think all the area that's sought to be zoned would need to be looked at. And... and just following on from that, I mean, you've appeared at these hearings quite a number of times, including for uh, the council in terms of authoring some section 42A reports. 
how how widespread do you think this wetland issue is for the various rezoning proposals that are in front of us? Is this one particularly, you know, if you rank them all in, on, on a scale from naught to 100, is this at sort of 99.9 .9 or is it in the middle or how would you assess it? Um, well, uh, I, I would say, and this is what I've said to a number of local authorities about the place, um, if you are looking to rezone Greenfields land and it has waterways of any sort across it, or it has gullies and land that looks wet, um, then you are into the realm of um, having potentially some significant challenges. I think this is, if you made me put a percent on it. Well, you have to put a percentage on I'm just trying to get a sense from you as where in the sensitivity scale you think this I, I think this is I think this is right up there in terms of sensitivity because you have not just not just a gully and wetlands, you've got a gully that and a system that feeds into the Waipa, which goes into the Waikato, which then brings in the vision and strategy as well. And you have a number of complicating factors there. Yeah, but and, and this is the yeah. issue. You can zone you can zone land. Can you get the regional consents to make it happen? No, I understand that point, but I'm trying to understand why you, you say this area of land is particularly sensitive. I understand that it's close to the Waipa, but certainly the submissions that we've heard from Waikato Tainui and others is that a lot of the district is in that sensitive category and we need to give effect to the vision and strategy, and so on and so forth. I'm just asking you for the reasons other than proximity to the river, which I understand, what is it about this site that would make it different from the hundreds of others that are sought to be rezoned in the in the district? Yeah, okay, sorry. That's what I I'm trying to get a, a sense yeah. of from your point of view. Yeah, so I think it's because in order to access the extent of the zoned land, and especially in terms of where the road was proposed in terms of the structure plan, that's that's part of the difficulty because getting access to the development will need regional consents that are crossing gullies, potentially wetlands, and you just might not be able to do it. Isn't That's that going to be the case for a big chunk of the district? Isn't that almost a, you know, if you put your doomsday cap on and say that's sort of almost a fatal flaw for the future of the district? Well, yes. it's all, There's a lot of low-lying land, there's a lot of peatland, there's a lot of... Um, what used to be called swamp. Now, you know, it, right through the area, there's only, I think, 8% of the original lakes and wetlands that were originally present, all those sorts of things. I just I just want to be really clear why, in your opinion, and I take, I, I understand what you've said, and I think it's points that are well made, but I'm trying to look at the relativity of this site versus all the others that we have to deal with and what it is that you say distinguishes this. And, I, and I, I know you've said it's got gullies and it might have wetlands, but that's not unique to this property. Mm. Well, you're, not, you're actually touching on an issue or, and this has been the effect of the NPSFM, that um, the effect of it is very widespread. And um, you may be able to pick another property, I don't know, 30 kilometres away somewhere else in the district that's got a similar issue. But the, that's the effect of the NPS. Um, and I think with this site, we're, we're talking, and I've talked a lot about the NPS and those practical, practical difficulties. So that's one aspect that's informed where we support the zone boundary ban. But when you filter in all the other um, all the other aspects or constraints in this locality, you know, we've talked, so Mr. Manx has talked about the sort of landscape and visual things. You've got the gullies, you've potentially got the wetlands, you've got the cultural values and so on. It all just builds a picture that it's quite a complicated little spot. Mr. Chairman, could I just add one, one thought to that? You say, why is it special? It's a fair question. Because <laughs> everything's special to everyone, isn't it? 
But the, 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 I think it's the wetland, for, for, for me, in addition to whatever the national policy statement and so on says, this is the last uh, drainage point into the Waipa. This is the, this is the very bottom of the catchment. And, and you know, th these, these low-lying ones are a bit rarer. But I'm actually thinking about this as much from the point of view of Narawahia as anything. It, when, when the Riverside, River Terraces subdivision went in, which was the last variation, some of the evidence the council gave said, well, look, you know, this is fine. It, it, it fits into the town. It's over the railway. It's on the edge of the river. And then we've got the, we've got, uh, the Pukiatua, we've got the cemetery, and we've got the hills. It's a natural end point to the town, which I think was correct. And I still think that's correct, that you've got some topographical features, these, these low hills with the gully coming around, which could be a terrific southern boundary. And I mean, that gully system in the future could be a terrific green link. If you want green links, that's the place where you put your walkways to give peop the people of Narawahi access. I think we should, we, we sh when you say that, I think you said 8% or something of the lakes or whatever were left. I mean, there's so little of the stuff left I think we could do something here, looking ahead 50, 100 years, that would give the people of Narawahia a terrific southern boundary. Instead, what we've had suddenly, you know, three years on from the 2017 variation, oh, let's just sort of cut right through the hill on the wetland and go south. I, I, there's, a, there's a disconnect here. Right, thank you. No, I, I understand that point. It's been well made. My final question is for you, for you Mr. Mansur. I just want to just clarify one issue. You've mentioned at paragraph 27 of your written statement where you've cited the 2014 landscape study that you undertook for the district back at that time. Um, yeah. And you've quite fairly referenced your conclusion from that, um, which, which is the paragraph that starts overall with the exception of. The section 42A report seems to have placed a fair bit of weight on that statement and, use, and used it to say there's nothing special about this area from a landscape point of view that would prevent it from being developed residentially. I think that's the thrust of what they're saying. Could you just sort of reconcile that, that um, and I'm happy, I can share the screen if you want so that you can, you can see it and everyone else can. Let me just, let me just do that. Yeah, I think, um, and, and I'm not trying to be cute about it. I'm just trying to give you the opportunity to explain why what's what Mr. Upton is seeking and your view at the moment, or your view as expressed in your evidence at least, lines up with that statement. Because I think the 42A report author has pointed to that as perhaps being a bit anomalous. So I want to give you the opportunity to, um, to clarify that for us, please. Yes. Um, so just in, in my presentation notes, which I think you also have at um, yes. paragraph 12, I also sort of comment that I think that the 42A report kind of paints half the picture here and picks out the, um, uh, and is taken out of context. And it's really looking at uh, what the purpose of this report was uh, and that while it's identifying that you know that there are some. Um, it's the subtle changes that that are important um, in, in maintaining that sort of unique character, as I've written up there. And once one sort of breaches the boundary, which is formed by the hill country, etc., you're starting to move into a next catchment. You're starting to affect these areas outside of. Now, Wahia, as it exists, as a contained urban area. No, that's fine. I just, I just wanted you to be able to explain that mm. to us directly, rather than yeah. just relying on what was, what was written, and, and yeah. that's helpful. And thank you for doing that. Mm. Is there anything else from the panel? It would appear not. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That's been very helpful, and it's given us um, something pretty meaty to chew on. I think it's fair to say. So, thank you for that. Um, you won't be getting a, a response from us in the very short term because we're going to be issuing all our decisions as a package across the district. Um, but we're appreciative of the time you've spent both in preparing the information and, and appearing here today. So thank you all very much for that. And thank you for listening.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Our next submitter is the Perry Group. Um, Ms. Barry Pacino and Mr. Collier, please. Good morning, everyone. Morning. morning. Yes, good morning, uh, commissioners, council staff. Uh, on the presumption that the commissioners have read both the legal submissions and Mr. Collier's evidence, I note that this morning, Mr. Collier further submitted a summary submission and apologies that that wasn't presented earlier. Uh, but I did feel it was helpful um, going back through documents to finding uh, original document of consultation at the time with Waikato District Council from Perry's in 2018 as to their comprehensive plan for the site to get an understanding of uh, what remains the only issue effectively of Perry's submissions, which is the appropriateness of residential zoning over the small triangle. Uh, as set out in my legal submissions, uh, it was anticipated that that land would by this time be in Perry's ownership, uh, but due to protracted negotiations with Waka Katahi, uh, that hasn't eventuated yet. Um, without going too much into the detail, which I've set out in my legal submission, it's not related to anything other than a lack of technical agreement as to how stormwater will be managed from the expressway, which will require it to be repiped under the road and away from Te Awa Lakes. And secondly, um, is the obvious one as to finance and funding of the relocation of that stormwater. Uh, neither of these are die in the ditch uh, issues, but they are ones that are taking some time to sort. In the meantime, as I've said in my submissions, the issue of zoning remains and should be separate from that, in that the underlying zoning and the designation are two separate matters. <coughs> what we have here is the residential zoning for a large piece of, of land, which Perry's is intending to comprehensively develop, and keeping a small isolated piece of land with rural zoning makes no sense um, from a planning perspective or from a legal perspective in terms of looking at how the site will be comprehensively developed. And Mr. Collier goes into that in detail in terms of what it may do in terms of activity classification or how it's treated if it has a separate zoning than the rest. Um, acknowledging the aspects where acoustic issues, reverse sensitivity issues, they all are already uh, overlays, objectives and policies, all which would play out through a resource consent process, which in our submission is the appropriate course rather than the very blunt tool of the zoning to attempt to address those issues. Ms. Barry Pacino, can we stick up a map of the, or photo of the, of the, of the particular um, area? Uh, yes, Mr. Collier submitted to Mr. Bell this morning a map that was presented to Waikato District Council through the draft plan. And I wonder if Mr. Bell could put that on a share screen. Yeah, I can check that up just one second. Okay. Is this the document that was submitted this morning? Yes, the map. Yes, there's a, there was a map that was sent through this morning. It's gonna be helpful if, if it's the map I'm thinking of, it's figure one of your summary statement, Mr. Collier. Yes, it's to, to To help um, Mr. Cooney's question. It's going to be helpful to actually have that picture zoomed back out a bit because there's, that shows the property. It doesn't really show the context. And I think it's the context particularly that he's looking for. <clears throat> no, I don't mean zoom the picture out. I mean find, a, <laughs> find another <laughs> picture that shows the, shows the property in context. Is there a property um, I can search that's closest to it? Uh, probably if you just search Kuno Road. C O K E K E. No, no, K E. Oh, my, my apologies. K E. Crew. Crew. No. Crew. Crew not row. Down the there bottom. Go. Yes. My geography skills aren't the best. Uh, 
Uh, I've just, you could navigate me to the correct. Whereabouts am I going, Mr. Collier? So if you if you zoom in on, you'll see a, a small square, a small sort of square area of, yeah, just so zoom down slightly, a little bit more. Just in there, yes, you can see that triangle. Area between the river, the expressway, and the purple at the bottom, isn't it? Yes. To the left. Yeah. It's, it's the one to the left of the pink. It's the orange to the left of the pink. Orange to the left of the pink. The I triangle think. itself is just to the right of the, of the purple square, which is the, the um, yep. commercial area. Yeah. So it's that triangular area in oh. there. I don't know whether you can see my cursor or not. No, we can't see your cursor, but you could, if you could, if you get the... the so if you just, sorry, it was actually in a good location, if you just go back to where you were, and then, and then the, move, move. Let's get, the, let's get the screen transferred to you, and then you can make it very obvious and clear where it is. Yeah. I don't think I can transfer screens to... Okay. So, the, so the very purple area, the small purple square area, so we're, yes, so just to the left, oh no, if you just, sorry, just go back to where you were on the right hand bottom right. corner of the map. So keep going down. Right, you'll see see the word J16. Yes. And then there's a blue area to the left of that. There is a triangular area. So just stop, that is, so that is the commercial area and the triangular area is where you've got the cursor now. So between the word J16 and the blue area is a triangular area. That's the one, that's it there. That's the 1.3 hectares. Yeah, thank you. Appro approximately. That's the approximate location of it. Okay, thanks. Very good. And just zoom that back out just so that everyone's very clear where it is. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks, Ms. Barry Pacino. Thank you, sir. So just to clarify, I was able to listen in to a small part of the Ports of Auckland submission yesterday, and I'm not sure if this was um, it, perhaps a, a lack of clarification or, or um, I would hope it wasn't deliberate obfuscation. But it did appear as if the Ports of Auckland was suggesting that its opposition to the residential zoning related to the whole um, in terms of what was notified of Perry's land. Uh, that's not correct in terms of their submission. It is solely focused on the 1.3. So if the Ports of Auckland uh, is, Mr. Appenot is online, perhaps that can be clarified for the record, but for the purposes of scope, it is very clear that their opposition is solely relating to that small triangle, not the notified residential. Uh, and just in terms of that, I note that his evidence does cover the, and the submission supports of Auckland quite uh, aggressively focuses on reverse sensitivity, acoustic overlays and attempts for rules relating to no complaints, covenants or otherwise, which have to go through this planning process. But for the purposes of Perry's submission, it, as earlier stated, it's fully anticipated that this land, either through Waka Katahi um, submissions, which also seek an acoustic overlay type restriction along the highways, or in relation to the Horatu industrial area, that this land would be subject to acoustic standards and treatments, uh, the final version of what that may look like is still yet to be determined, but it's not uh, that Perry is, is seeking to challenge that in any way. Similarly with stormwater, uh, Mr. Collier also mentions that in this plan, there isn't a specific zoning like a green belt zoning or stormwater, but again, it's fully anticipated that stormwater would need to be treated on the site. And it's most likely um, as shown in the diagram shown by Mr. Collier, that this would be the appropriate location for that. So that, that's really the summary of the issues for Perry's. 
Um, it really just comes down to the appropriateness of zoning and ensuring for consistency that this isn't treated as an orphan site. Um, Mr. Collier has gone on in his evidence about that even if you did attempt to put it in housing, we're talking here less than 10 houses. Uh, so it's not so much a yield issue, it's more about consistency of the zoning across the site for comprehensive development that Perry Six this has a residential on it. In fact, in a way, it will have a detriment to it at the time of offer from uh, NZTA back that, of course, the zoning of, of residential is probably going to impact on, on market price at the time of resale. What, what I think would be helpful, we have got Mr. Collier's uh, summary statement, but we literally got it at about three minutes to nine. So other than going flick, flick, flick and, and looking at the picture, we're not really au fait with the summary. We've read his evidence and, and so forth. Um, but I think it would be helpful if he could read that um, because we haven't read it and it clearly articulates exactly where things are at. Yes, sir. So I'm happy to take you through that. Um, that's if that's an appropriate time to do that, Ms. Barry Pacino, if you're finished. Does that suit? Yes, thank you, sir. Mr. Very Collier, good. Just read your summary through. Yes, it. thank you, sir. So um, just in terms of my summary, um, what I have included is, a, is figure one, which identifies the extent of this 1.3 hectare area. And it's on the left-hand side, you'll see a little area that's shaded yellow, which is identified as being kind of open space, a stormwater management area. Now, that's the approximate extent of the 1.3 um, hectares of the what we refer to as the orphan site that Perry's are, are currently talking to NZTA uh, and negotiating over the, the return of. So I think it's important to put the scale and the context of that area into some kind of perspective in terms of the wider environment. So on the effectively on the southern side of the expressway, you've got the Tiawa Lakes uh, development, and that is delivering around about 1,100 um, dwelling unit equivalents. Um, and then in terms of the, the rest of the, the Perry's land, uh, which, is, which is shown on this, um, this indicative ACOM plan, um, that's likely to deliver around about 300 um, allotments. Uh, it's about um, 18 and a half hectares in total. And so this 1.3 hectares of land is effectively a piece that's left up against the, um, the expressway. Um, and in my view is likely to be used for stormwater and open space. It's, um, the, the land itself is not in, in good condition at the moment. It's, it's all very low lying. It's kind of left over from, um, from the state highway uh, works. But just returning to my, um, to my um, summary, uh, because of the scale of the, the site and effectively where it is, it's, it's quite squeezed and constrained against the, uh, the expressway and it was required for roading purposes. In my, in my view, the small scale and nature of the, of the land doesn't really raise any significant issues for me in terms of um, development capacity or strategic planning alignment. It is a very small area, and if it were to be used for residential, as I've noted in my summary, um, Perry's would be lucky to, to obtain a yield of, of up to 10 lots um, from it. Um, in terms of um, a rural zoning, um, as Ms. Barry Pacino um, has alluded to, that would have a knock-on effect um, for the future assessment and the status of um, any applications which Perry has made for the comprehensive development proposal um, on the balance of their land uh, in terms of the wider site. So that is a, that is a concern for me. Um, I note that there are also no alternative zones available. Um, there are no uh, green belt zones or, or private kind of open space zones um, which could be uh, applied to the land as an alternative. Um, and I've also commented on the, um, the evidence from Wapta Kotahi and uh, the ports of Auckland. In terms of the issue of noise management um, and setbacks and stormwater, those matters have not yet been finally resolved um, with Waka Kotahi, but I would note that uh, there is a 25 metre uh, setback from the expressway that's in the plan as notified and Waka Kotahi have sought that that's actually increased to 35 metres. 
So there would be a, a natural 35 meter setback. And there is also the 100 meter noise contour, uh, which applies from the, um, from the state highway. And I believe that's also subject to submissions from uh, Waka Kotahi. So I'm not, I'm not actually 100% sure on where that has, uh, has currently kind of landed. Um, but it's certainly not an unusual situation to not have these matters resolved, um, given that negotiations to return the land um, have been quite prolonged and, um, and difficult. So those acoustic I'm overlays... I'm happy for you to read your summary statement. I mean, you're well, covering a lot of ground that Ms. Barry Pacino has already covered. Yes. So, um, so, so I've, kind of, I've kind of summarised, if you like, my summary um, statement. I've, I've said that the 100 metre noise sensitive area and the specific um, yard are typical to address uh, effects and on sites such as this. Um, and if uh, in the future development of this 1.3 hectares, um, Perry's couldn't comply with the, the requirements that were imposed, then that would in itself also trigger a, a re requirement for resource consent. I've also said in my uh, summary that I agree with the evidence of Mr. Arbuthnot, uh, that the potential for reverse sensitivity effects in relation to the horror to acoustic overlay uh, can be addressed by that. Um, and that would that overlay also applies to the uh, to the residential zone land which is owned by Perry's. So I have no no concerns with that overlay also being imposed um, such that it would then be need to be complied with by any future uh, residential development. Um, and then I've concluded by just saying that if the, even if the 1.3 hectares were to be developed, for residential purposes rather than for open space uh, or stormwater, the, the, the yield is relatively low and, and I've assessed it as around, around about 10 lots. Um, and that's because of the, uh, the ground conditions, the need for setbacks uh, and, the, um, and, the, and the, very, um, the very constrained nature of that, of that particular area. So thank you, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you, Mr. Paul. I think that is pretty clear. I think between the two of you, you've outlined the proposition pretty clearly, but let's see if there are any questions. Mr. Fulton? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Mark? No, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Uh, no, all very clear. Thank you very much. Ms. Gale? No questions, thank you. Mr. Cooney? Um, can we put that um, figure one back up? Yeah. Um, that shows a line along the um, along the expressway. It looks like some plantings there. Looks like reserve areas all the way along. Are they? Is that right? What are they? Yeah, that's a very um, that's a very low lying area, then, Mr. Cooney. So adjacent to the expressway is very low lying. It would be used for open space and stormwater management. So why can't you do the same with this lot of land down the end there in the same way to run a consistent sort of um, almost de facto reserve area along there? Well, well, effectively, that's what I've said, that it's likely to be used for stormwater and open space. Um, and then what I've said is even if it's not, it's likely to only yield a very small number of, uh, number of residential lots. The issue for me is what is the most appropriate zone? Is it rural or is it residential? And to me, if it's, if it's kept as rural, it effectively becomes an orphan piece of rural land um, sitting adjacent to the interchange uh, and adjacent to residential. And so- Does, it, my, does that matter when its purpose is to act as a, a sort of de facto reserve? Does it matter what its signed is? Well, yes, it, it does in the context of, of a comprehensive development for Perry's because it will have an impact on the, on the status of activities, for example, and the consenting process. Yeah. Um, and so, yield. and sorry, so, and, and also in the context of yield, it can, and it can also be used to, to justify more yield on the balance of the land, for example. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I don't have any questions. That's pretty clear in my mind. So thank you both um, for presenting to us today and for the um, comprehensive information you previously filed with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Mr Holbrook's on the ball. He's um, anticipated um, being invited to speak next. He's turned his video and microphone on. So welcome, Mr Holbrook. Welcome, Mr Metcalf. Just repeating what we've said to everybody else. We have read your material. We know you've got a presentation. Um, we're looking, and we, 
I think your proposal is not unknown to us, let's put it that way. So um, without wanting to preempt how, how you're going to present to us, let's get on with it. Sure. Um, what I was pr proposing to do, Commissioners, was um, quickly go through my summary um, presentation yes. um, and then pass over to Mr Metcalf, who's also got some um, some concluding comments, if that's, if that's OK with you. Very good. So if I get Mr Bell to bring up the, um, the presentation. I've got it here, if, if that helps. Yep, that's fine. Let, I can do that, Mr Bell. Right, if we can go to the next slide. So no, I'll, I'll put it on slideshow first, hang on. Here we go. Here we go. Sure, so you're, you're no doubt aware of the of the, the property in question. It's 68 hectares on the western edge of, of Te Kauwhai Village. So the, the two um, parcels of land that make up the, the Metcalf block are um, edged in, in red. Um, and the proposed village zoning um, of this of this property, which was in place at the time the PDP was um, was notified. Um, you can also see the year park um, in blue, um, other areas that are proposed to become village and um, some existing country living zoning in, in Tokofi as well. Um, I mentioned that this was um, zoned um, by the council at the time of notification um, and Mr Metcalf's involvement, I guess, with council goes back um, to around about 2017. Um, and at, at that time, future proof was being reviewed and um, Mr Metcalf uh, participated in that process and, and in having to co-fi identified as a, as a future growth node for the Waikato district. Um, that dialogue carried on with council staff and um, a number of reports were obtained for this property. Um, namely, a, quite a detailed geotechnical report, a transportation report, um, and a infrastructure report were provided. And, and I believe those reports um, were factored into the council's Section 32A analysis for the um, for when the, the PDP was was zoned. Um, Mr. Metcalf's um, submission um, at the time was in support of the proposed village zoning. So, if we go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, it gives you an, um, a, a, a bit of a framework plan that that's been done in the background and this is um, well, earlier versions of this plan have, have certainly been shared with, with council staff um, since 2017 and it sort of just demonstrates how the property um, may be um, developed into different development blocks and um, how this in, this particular property would um, interact with um, with Tokofi village and some of the other um, plans and structure plan features that are going on there with the air park and other village zones, et cetera. Um, one thing to note is this, this property is in uh, whilst in two, um, two titles. Um, there is a, uh, in two entities, they are, um, they are in um, family ownership. So one is, is Greg and the other is um, Greg's son. So it does actually represent at 68 hectares, quite a, a large single ownership piece of land. So from a, a development perspective, um, makes makes life um, a bit easier. Um, we've done a little bit of work in terms of potential yields in this um, for these blocks, um, and and I, it, you'll appreciate, commissioners, that that the um, the vision for the for the village zone has changed um, since 2017 when when Mr Metcalf first started talking to council, through to uh, where we've landed now with with um, the section 42A report recommendations from Mr Cleese. Um, but if we if we go back to the original proposal um, for the village zone, if there were going to be unserviced lots, so that was 300 square metre density, um, you would be looking at around about 160 lots in that in that area. Um, if we went to a thousand square metre lots, which was the service solution at the time of notification for the village zone, looking at around about sort of 480 lots, um, and then. In reading Mr. Clee's report, he he indicates that you know the um, that potentially this this land could actually be suitable for more residential or suburban density. So I I've done some maths on those. If if we went as far as 450 square meters, um, which would be the minimum lot size, um, you'd be looking at around about 1,060. Um, however, if, if we were going to look for something a little bit a little less dense than that, and say we used 750 square metre lots as the as the basis, I think it would land at around about 640 lots. 
So I hope that's just helpful in, in terms of giving a little bit of context in terms of what, what the development potential is of, um, of this particular piece of land. Um, we can go to the next, the next slide. Um, so the basis for Tokofi, I mentioned that um, it was, you know, Tokofi has been identified in, in Future Proof as a, as a growth node. Um, and Mr. Cleese highlighted yesterday that um, this particular property sits outside of the, you know, the defined village limits and um, but, but future proof in the, in the um, regional policy st um, statement do give the ability to sort of flex outside of those defined limits in appropriate locations and, and he was in agreement that, that this is an, an appropriate location. Um, and also just to note that, that Waikato 2070 also identifies um, this particular property as being a, a residential growth node. And I've just put a snip of that up on the screen there. You can see the, um, the orange blob there um, with, a, with a time frame of 10 to 30 years. Um, and, and certainly the, um, the Waikato 2070 sort of talks about um, 450 square metre lot um, densities in, in these identified areas. We can go to the next slide. Um, so just to summarise, I guess, the position that, um, that the Section 42A um, has, has come to. So agreement in, in principle that the Metcalf block is, is suitable for rezoning. Um, it recommends that the Metcalf property may be more appropriate as a future urban zone rather than, than a live village zoning. Um, and the basis for this recommendation from my reading of, of the reports is that um, the, the primary reason is that once water, wastewater services and a structure plan in place, it, it may be more appropriate as a long-term residential zone, so, so higher densities potentially than what the village zone is, is currently offering. Um, and Mr Cleese notes the uncertainty around the, the timeliness and funding for network infrastructure. Next slide. So just briefly, um, I'll just summarise um, a couple of, of, of points there before I pass to, to Mr Metcalf. Um, so Mr Metcalf is seeking a live zoning um, and the reason for that is that he, he does want to advance subdivision and development as, as quickly as possible. So I mentioned this um, dialogue with council has been going on since 2017. Um, development in the early stages of the block are likely to include a, a retirement village and, and potentially some larger lot residential on some of the steeper areas of the of the site um, and noting that these these types of um, development could potentially develop um, without the need for trunk infrastructure. Um, in regards to the extension of trunk infrastructure, um, it's it's noteworthy that um, there are two unfunded projects in the long term plan for to Kofi and the extension of services. Um, however, the reason that they are identified as unfunded after I, I, I did some inquiry was that is because the, the zoning for Tokofi is not yet confirmed. So we've essentially got a, a sort of a, a chicken and egg standoff situation, and, and Mr. Cleese refers to that in his reports as well. Next slide. Um, so just in terms of the, the, um, the sort of costings that have been put in, in terms of that um, long-term plan, there was nine million um, identified. Now, I, I don't know how robust that, um, that figure is. I, I haven't um, seen any background um, to how that nine million is, has been um, reached. Um, but essentially, if we, if we look at a potential yield of 835 houses in the village zone overall, and that's, that's the figure that's mentioned in Mr. Cleese's report um, for the village zone across to Kofi, not just the, the Metcalf block, um, you're talking about a cost of around $11,000 per lot. Um, so I just make a comment there that, that you know, that's not a, a hugely um, uh, big number um, and you know from in terms of development contribution um, rates um, 11,000 um, is certainly not um, not out over the odds so to speak so that sort of does represent a, a viable development proposition based on that nine million dollar figure. Um, Greg, well, Mr Metcalf will speak to this um, himself as well, but he is willing to engage with um, Waikato District Council and um, Watercare to fund infrastructure provision outside of the, the long-term budgets um, and has had an initial meeting um, with, with staff on that. Um, and certainly the, the request at the moment from, um, from him is that consideration be given to providing to Kofi with a, with a live zoning. Um, and that, that a, a rule framework can be put in place to ensure that um, that development doesn't occur until those services are in place. So that 
is um, a quick run through of um, my evidence, um, and if it's appropriate, I can I can pass over to um, to Mr. Metcalf. Yeah, let, let's carry on. If we've got any questions, we'll ask them of both of you as we've done um, during the rest of the morning. So thank you. I'll turn thank that I'll turn the screen off so I can see everyone's face a bit more clearly. Thanks, Mr. Metcalf. Just when you're ready. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Morning, Commissioners. Um, can I just take a minute to, um, I guess, uh, look at something that the commissioners were delving into yesterday around the demand statistics, et cetera, um, because I believe in the district demand is way above uh, potentially what is, uh, is, is forecast. A um, couple of examples. Um, the level land, and I see uh, Howard is talking later this afternoon, but that, uh, there were 16 sections all auctioned in the uh, level property last week for argument's sake, all 16 sold at auction, all well above expectations, and frankly, all above the first home buyers that sat in the room trying to find a reasonable section to, uh, to build on. Um, and basically, they, they went to really spec builders to, to some extent coming out of Hamilton because they're being forced out, and these sections sold, well, the cheapest one was 410,000. Um, Rangatahi, just quickly moving on there. Um, Rangatahi, when it was first envisioned, had a life frame of 15 to 20 years, if you like, in terms of uh, uh, the development of the sections and the potential sell through. They are now on to stage three, if you like, of six stages. Titles have only been issued since March last year, if you like, and they're looking like being sold out in some four to five, uh, four to five years, the way the way it's presently going. So demand is there, demand is pent up, um, and to some extent, lack of demand is, is creating real problems for certainly first home buyers. This morning's news up at six thirty, writing a few notes for you, folks. TV three. Christchurch is the most affordable uh, city in New Zealand for first home buyers to buy and, and settle in. And why? Be well, we all know the reason is because of the fact that supply meets demand, broadly speaking. Yes, it was unfortunate the way it came about with the, with the earthquake and uh, uh, I guess the legislative restructure of land. But anyway, down there, there's a balanced market um, for supply. Um, I would like to some extent turn around the thinking a little bit, and I think the commissioners were delving into this themselves yesterday in the, um, certainly around Taupere um, and, uh, and Narawa here, thinking, trying to get to grips with the numbers and how much supply is really needed. Um, in Taupere, you know, I'd like to propose that in Taupere and Narawa here and to Kofi, um, a, a lift in the demand. I believe is there, that thinking should enable more land and not less land. Um, and if you come back now to basically to um, our situation, we've actually been uh, negotiating and talking with council actually since 2014. We go back that far um, and a very sound plan was developed, um, I think for the village zone and um, uh, basically council came up with a proposal around village zone. <laughs> And, um, I think it was quite appropriate at the time. Yes, that's morphed now into potentially the Hamilton City wanting more density and, um, and potentially a, a future urban. Um, in our case out there, sir um, and commissioners, you know, we've been through, we've, we've done the Three Waters report, done the traffic report, uh, we've done... Uh, well, three, oh, we've done the land, um, the, you know, the geotech, the, all those things are suitable for this land to be um, to be rezoned, if you like. They've all been ticked off, but, um, and hence that's why council promoted it in the proposed plan um, in the first place, I guess. Um, just referring uh, to my notes here, excuse me for a second. Um, infrastructure. Yes. Initially, we would have liked to have that future thinking involving on-site infrastructure type options. But councils throughout New Zealand are reluctant to go down that track apart from small um, individual areas controlled by a tight body corp. A good example is probably the Tamahiri 
uh, rest home facility that went in there um, on a, uh, a localised infrastructure um, network. Uh, and to a degree, I, I agree with uh, their thinking. No one wants to be left with a mess in 30 years' time when those systems are broken down and the council's the last, the last man standing, if you like. Um, so we've been talking with council now for five months on front-footing uh, the infrastructure. Um, we can afford to do so uh, with the density that we have out there, um, and we can <laughs> come back to horror too. We've been in talks with Watercare, um, uh, facilitated by council, um, at a high level, admittedly, but it seems that the upgrading, recent upgrading of the horror two pump station and the systems around that can handle the horror two supply, uh, sorry, the Tecofi uh, subdivision. Water weren't quite so sure in that they hadn't looked at Tecofi as such, but did make the comment that the, um, the systems developed around Huntley and Narawahe to improve the, the water supply and flow between the two towns has worked extremely well. Um, uh, having no water issues and supply over the hot summers and, uh, and did uh, mention the, uh, the big new water storage facilities uh, close to actually Mr Upton's land there, um, just in the Jackson Street area. Um, so I would like to propose, um, you know, that we look at going to a live zone, if you like, with a number of properties out there. That being um, the Shores property, at 663 to Kofi Road, the Davis's property at 703, the Stead's property at 703D, uh, Mr. Sam's property at 669 Horror 2 Road, um, and our property at 702 and uh, 730 Horror 2 Road. That land is presently all the land that is recommended to be um, fuzz, if you like, or future urban. Um, and is a 100 hectares um, in its extent, if you like. Um, we've heard about the, uh, the numbers that that land may well supply, if you like. Um, but what I'm, I guess, promoting is that that land that's going to be rezoned anyway to, to at least future urban um, should become live because it has the numbers, if you like, in terms of lots to support a pipe uh, back to, uh, back to uh, horror two. I know that jumps ahead of Mr. Cleese's um, recommendation uh, that it should be, uh, and, and in my simple terms, I talk about locked up in fuzz uh, for a, uh, an extended period. Um, in Mr. Cleese's, uh, not defense, but he wasn't aware of the, the background uh, information where we had already been with council and promoting uh, that a developer front foots the infrastructure um, and, uh, and, and, and takes a lead there. So, um, so yeah, in conclusion, um, I guess I'm promoting um, that all the area presently uh, earmarked for fuzz be actually uh, earmarked for live. Um, it doesn't mean that we or anybody else can do anything tomorrow without council's approval um, and all the other boxes that have to be ticked, ticked. And, um, and so, um, so, yeah, my promotion is, uh, is for a live zone for those areas, please. All right. Thanks, Mr. McCarthy. I think that's pretty clear. Let's see if the panel has any questions for you. Um, let's start with you, Mr. Marg. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Has there been any collaboration around the other four properties, Mr. Metcalf? Yes, there has in terms of um, uh, the Sneeds property and the Davis's property. Um, and uh, Mr. Sam's property, um, and that's where the uh, cafe is and the, um, and the uh, market gardens, if you like, um, mm. has come in late, if you like. Um, but that property is the, you would have seen on the structure plan um, that Bevan put up, that property uh, needs to potentially go into uh, into fuzz or into live zone so that the roading link can come through from um, Tikai Road through to uh, through the Horror 2 Road um, and create a, a natural throughway, if you like. 
so um, so so yes, in terms of um, the Steads um, Davises, um, which are a major portion of the um, uh, the shores. No, to my knowledge, um, but um, yes, that's the situation. Thank you. Mr. Fulton? Um, no, thanks. Um, <clears throat> no, thank you. I'm very familiar with the background to all of this issue as well, so um, I've got a good understanding of it all. Thank you very much. That's good. She's not, she's not involved in this. Oh, that's right. Sorry. No, she isn't too. Thank you. Ms. Sedgwick. Um, and, and I am. Um, so I'm looking at your report, uh, which indicates that there is a preference from water care for the trunk infrastructure solution rather than a privately owned um, sewage operation. I've understood that correctly. Yes, you have. Um, they um, definitely uh, feel that they worry about what will happen in 20 years' time, if you like, to these private schemes, and um, and uh, will the council be left with with, with an issue? Even um, so, and, and I think perhaps quite rightly. To, um, so um, you know, to Kofi to Horror too, it's only six kilometres right. um, down a piece of flat land over a, uh, a, a, a a small hill type range, if you like, that maybe raises uh, rises up to maybe. 30 or 40 metres, then, then straight back down to the um, to the infrastructure of Horror 2. Um, quite very similar to what you'll be familiar with, what um, with how it was done at Pocono, if you like, mm -hmm. and piped back to um, Tuakau. Um, in my submission, it won't be as difficult or as extensive as that, um, but uh, very similar. Um, and the, the your property, which is currently farming land, um, if that is is village zone, um, what would be your opinion on the uh, acoustic requirements from the airfield or to, to, to counteract noise from the airfield? Yes, I think I'll get Mr. Uh, to speak to that. Yeah, so the, the property is affected by a, um, a noise overlay. Um, that map here with, with me at this hearing, unfortunately. Um, but certainly the rules in the village zone um, require some additional acoustic treatment for houses within that um, within that overlay. Mm -hmm. so that doesn't affect the whole property. It's a relatively small mm -hmm. over, 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 overall. Um, but yeah, there would be requirements in the in the plan to require houses to have um, acoustic treatment in that area. Yeah. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Kearney? Um, just to clarify, um, you're, you're saying you're prepared to meet the funding for the delivery of um, wastewater uh, services. Is, is that, is that um, just to get this straight, is, is that the main, the trunk service from Horror 2 to, um, to your property or to uh, to Kofi or what? What what are you prepared to fund? Or is it just from to Kofi when when the main when the trunk services are, are provided from to Kofi out to your property? What 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 are you prepared to fund? We're prepared to fund uh, the line from Horror to 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 Kofi. Um, in partnership with with council because council would no doubt want it probably um, larger than would just some um, service um, our say 600 lots if you like they'd want to um, perhaps future proof it for um, uh, for uh, for the for future development um, give you an idea I understand that Pocono back there again there are now three lines have been put in if you like I think they're up to the third one now uh, because the first two, if you like, have uh, the volume has um, uh, uh, the you know the, the sewerage demand, if you like, has uh, has met a, an extra one needs to go in. But yes, we're um, we're prepared uh, to uh, to uh, enter into development um, uh, agreement with council to uh, front foot that, as long as we get obviously the um, you know the number of lots to make it sensible. And that's why I'm um, wanting to include 
from a practical reason, um, a sensible reason, the other the other four lots I mentioned, um, they, they are about another 30 hectares, if you like, and um, whether or not they ultimately want to join in the the funding will, will I guess, be up to them. Um, but um, but yes, we're talking about the complete line up and over the hill and out to Tikofi, um and being front-footed by us, the developers. The other thing that is just worthwhile keeping in mind here as well is that there is actually a small um, wastewater treatment um, plant in Tikofi already, um, and I think it, it services a dozen or so houses, um, and I believe that 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 um, plant is, is well past its use-by date, um, and I, I, I don't quote me on it, but I think its, it's consents are up for renewal, so there's certainly an opportunity to provide a, a wider solution for, for the existing houses in, in Tikofi as well. Okay. And from your discussions um, with the various parties, Three Waters and the Council, is there any enthusiasm um, being shown to, to agree with you to, to sort of support uh, the work program that would be anticipated? From my point of view, and I, uh, I believe there is, um, as I say, we've had um, uh, initial uh, council uh, facilitated talks with, uh, with now water care, if you like. Um, that was reasonably positive, um, but at a high level. Um, and, uh, but politically, I guess, um, you know, more supply is, um, is, is, is being uh, requested, if you like, and, and we're trying to uh, fill, that, fill that supply gap and get some stuff happening. I would envisage that, you know, we'd be looking at, you know, potentially in the three to five year framework, um, we would have, uh, we would have the infrastructure built um, in the in the three year area, and sections uh, coming up and coming on the market in the three four slash five five year range, as opposed to being pushed out beyond ten years, if you like. Um, and really, that's only happened because of the chicken and egg thing, um, where we have uh, you know we didn't have the zoning, so therefore it wasn't put put into the long term funding. Um, and um, and we're um, as I say we're we're prepared to front foot it just like Pocono did, um, and that's a very good example of what could be successfully done, albeit on a smaller scale. Um, ultimately, no one proposes that it's going to be um, the scale that Pocono is turning into, but um, we're proposing front footing it. Did you did you seek um, did you seek in your relief uh, residential zoning here? Um, on the basis of you, you'd be providing the, the, the services? We supported the um, village zone as notified, which allowed for a service outcome, um, albeit yeah. at lots that were a thousand square metres. Just looking at um, the, um, you want to sub subdivide down to 1,000 metres, uh, 1,000 1, square metres once you're, um, services are available there's been there's been general pushback uh, on that size because it can compromise the more intensive residential lots that you described earlier 450 or 700 um, so um, what why can't you agree with the section 42 author to say well look with we we we're in we're in talks with um with water care and the council uh we'll make it future urban at the moment we'll push things along we won't have to wait the 10 years that you say because we can, we we can get this as you just said before um going within three years so so where's the downside and putting it into future urban Probably the key one is is around having to, to go through a plan change process um, to to realise that that new zoning. Um, is that is that that difficult when you've got a future urban zoning? You've got you got your provision of services that you got lined up, um, and you still got to apply for a subdivision consent, and you do everything at the same time, don't you? 
Um, no, we'd have to definitely get the plan change done first before we put the subdivision consent in. Yeah, I know that, but you can almost yeah. do it co contemporaneously, couldn't you? Almost. You could, you I know it's a bit a, of a you can, fun, yeah, but yeah, um, you don't, you don't have to have you, it ready to, yeah, ready to go. You, you've got a strong case, haven't you? For sure. I mean, it's certainly having having the the future urban zoning, I guess, takes the sting out of um, that rezoning process. But it is still, as as we all know, a, a process that that could take. Um, a year um, by the time you prepare, lodge, submissions, hearings, decisions, appeals, you know, it, it, it could be at least a year. So um, it, it, I guess there's a, there's a time factor and, and a cost factor. Um, yeah. If we could achieve it by having a live zoning with, with some rule framework that, that it's quite clear to everyone around what um, has to happen um, to realise it, um, then I think that would, that would be a better um, outcome. All right. Okay. Well, th thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thanks. And I don't have any questions. Thank you. It's pretty clear. So that's fine. Thank you both for your time and for the preparation and, uh, for today's hearing. What Thank we'll you. do is we're going to break for morning tea. We, on paper, look like we're behind schedule, but I'm pretty confident that we that we aren't. Um, and I'm sure we'll make that time up after morning tea. So we're going to adjourn now till 10 past 11. And we'll hear from you, Mr. Schick, followed by Mr. Stead, uh, when we return. If you could please just turn your video and sound off, don't actually leave the meeting. And we'll see you back again at 10 past 11. All right, thanks everybody. And welcome back. Um, Mr. Schick, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if um, Mr. Bell could perhaps bring up um, my property on. Can everyone thank see you. that? Yes, thank you. Could you just put your video, if you're able to, we can sort of see the top of your head and the light, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just as a, um, a bit of a background, I bought the property back in, I think, 1995, in my recollection. And um, 18 months later, we I'm an earth moving contractor, I was. And we applied for a resource consent from district and environment Waikato, which was granted. And we mined sand virtually over the whole property um, up until the point in uh, 2006, the mining operation ceased. The um, land was completely reinstated. It was put back in the grass and we've milked cows ever since. Um, so my um, thoughts were I've got as 35 hectares, it's too small now to be an economic uh, dairy unit. So it's proposed at 70 years old. I um, decided that um, I had contoured it with this in mind and with um, country living in mind. And the, um, it all drains down into the, um, naturally into the uh, Te Ota Manui Lagoon, which is adjacent to um, the property. And with that in mind, um, with the walkway at the front of the property, it made sort of good sense to me to turn it into country living so that it can be, can be your children can walk to school, it's off a busy highway, and I'm surrounded virtually by lifestyle blocks currently. So um, that's the basis of uh, the method of my madness. Just to clarify, um, um, Mr. Schick, your submission. Uh, refers to your address as being 350 Bedford Road, but the submission itself talks about 359. Do you live at 350 and this relates to 359? Have I got that right? That's entirely correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify and make sure it wasn't typographical that a nine had become a zero somewhere. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So that's all you want to tell us? That's virtually it in a nutshell, really. All right, just for the panel's um, benefit. My understanding is we heard yesterday about Bedford Road, which is the road um, with the dog leg in it, and you can see the country living in the green, and there are those three properties on the corner there that have been recommended to be included in the zone. We, we heard about that yesterday, just by way of context. Yes, I was aware that um, those properties were and it just seemed to me to make good sense to um, for me to 
join the QI space. So, and um, okay, no, that's pretty clear. Let's, let's, let's see if there's any questions for you. Um, thank you, Mr. Schick. Um, Mr. Mark? No, nothing from me. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Sedgwick? Uh, no, nothing. Thank you very much. Ms. Gibb? Very clear. Thanks very much. Mr. Uh, Mr. Fulton? Um, yeah, no, thank you. But I, I can understand why you're uh, desiring to bring that into country living and um, um, understanding the neighbours got uh, their application um, talked about yesterday. So, um, no, thank you very much. Just, um, what did the uh, 42A planner, planner recommend for your property? Uh, recommend it. It's on page. Um, it's on page forty-three of the forty-two A report, and it recommends um, rejection and retain it as rural zoning. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, the one, the ones just down below yours is, uh, are recommended to be village. Yeah. What the forty-two A report says: the site's not identified as being appropriate for urban growth of, in any of the future-proof regional policy statement, Waikato twenty seventy, or the Tikofi structure plan documents. Given that the ge geographically the site does not align with any of the higher order directions regarding the location of urban growth, um, country living zoning would not align with the principles of the RPS or the policy eight of the NPS urban development. That's the that's the stated rationale, yeah, and that's okay. in paragraph one four nine yeah. of the forty two A report. Yeah, how, how big's your property, Mr. Shirk? Uh, it's thirty five hectares. Okay. And we can't currently run it as a dairy farm, but as I say, it's uh, uneconomic as a dairy farm. Um, the land has been changed somewhat because I mined over the area. Um, some 15 years ago or 20 odd years ago, the soil type is somewhat different to what was already there. It was reinstated using imported fill from mainly from Hamilton City for, for uh, it was coming in as, um, as um, Hamilton City is basically built on soft soils. We took back a lot of the spore from there. So soils virtually licorice all sorts. So it, um, whilst it grows reasonable cover of grass, it's it, can, can no longer be um, classified as, um, as high quality soils, in my view. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you very much. Okay. Thank and you I very much. And I don't have any questions either. Thank you very much, Mr. Schick. Thank you. Which brings us to you, Mr. Stead, please. Oh, you have to turn on uh, just a minute, I'll turn on the video. Okay. okay. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and your commissioners. By way of introduction, uh, my name is Marshall Stead, and along with my wife, Christine Stead, uh, we are original submitters in the zoning process. I've tabled three pages today, um, and I hope uh, Fletcher has them there. Can I just I confirm can, that? I can put those on the screen for you, if you like. Okay, thank you. Um, they the ones? Uh, yes, that, that will come up third. Oh, Is there two others? Yeah, there's two others. Which one do you want on oh, the screen one, first? Yeah, 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 the one that you kind of flick through quite quickly. Yeah, that that one. There. And could we enlarge, just at the moment, the, um, I guess, the highlight? No, not the one. Yeah, the one there. Could we just highlight the coloured areas that we have there. That should be okay if it could be more in the centre. Oh, I'm going to move it across. That's Thank great. You. There you go. Okay, we could probably just go down just a little, yeah, yeah. just down a little bit in size. Okay, great. Um, so I only have the three um, available for you today and I hope at appropriate times they can be put on the screens. I have some written notes and I am willing to make these available after this presentation. That will be good, thank you. During my ver verbal presentation I will be making reference to two of my neighbours as well. They share properties with us connecting an indicative <laughs> road and I have an absolute mandate from these neighbours as to their zoning views 
which is to have the operative live zoning accepted on their properties. My wife and I have lived in Te Kofi for close on 40 years. Our land is 11 hectares. Our immediate neighbor to the left is Mr. Lloyd Davis, who has resided on his property for 25 years and has approximately the sound, same amount of land. And Mr. Parmajit Singh is to the north of Lloyd and his land is four hectares. So that's just a little higher up than Lloyd Davis's property. Our intention, our aspiration is to develop our land into an inviting avenue type street setting and abide by council guidelines to give these roads names selected by the council to reflect the area's history and heritage. This area of our three properties helps retain the shape of the village, which is practical, it's logical, and it's sensible. We feel no greater than 3,000 square meters is an ideal size. It's a popular request from potential buyers in this area, and this, high, this size will help to retain the village look and keep the identity of Te Kofi Village alive. People are proud of the size. It allows some creative landscaping options, grow some fruit trees, a decent side veggie garden and lush plantings with an area for children and pets to play. The subdivision of, proposed subdivision of Stead, Davis and Singh will have a direct link to the existing Te Kofi School, which is just up there very close somewhere. Um, it's a popular decile 10 school. Uh, the kindergarten and a recently opened gumboots and grasshopper daycare and early learning centre. It's very close to the Te Kofi Hall, tennis courts, and a wonderful new, soon to be open uh, Saints Church Cafe. Uh, very close to the popular Te Manui walkway and the Perrin Park Retirement Village. All these are within just five minutes walk on existing paved sidewalks. And with the sports ground, our playground, skate park, only a few meters, uh, minutes further away, this is a desirable, lo logical location as the next land allocations to become a, a live zone. Okay, could we have the next um, one now? Um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Don't tell me which one it is because these aren't in the order. Thank okay. Presenting them to me. Total, total. That, that guy there, that guy there, and just, yeah, just make it just slightly smaller. Yeah. I'd just like to mention now, um, draw your attention to what I call four success stories involving village or country living in Te Kofi. The one just, uh, this is our property in the yellow. Just above it, you can see a. Um, yeah, that, so this just above it there. Yes, yes, sorry, exactly. Sorry, I've moved. Eagle Estate. Uh, no, not that guy. Uh, that one? Uh, yep, that one there. Now, you just had the cursor there. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about. This is a leafy, much admired, and well established Willow Brook. Um, it has 19 sections in it, which half of these border our property. Most are around 3,000 square meters with just a few just under or just over 2,500 metres. This has often been described as a jewel of the crown in Te Kofi. Basically, and I'm sorry, it doesn't show it in here, but basically um, a 10 minutes walk up the road is an equally impressive Westvale Lane, 15 sections, most of which are 5,000 square metre sections. And it's another example of an appealing feel in Te Kofi. <coughs> Right across the road from us, um, look, maybe, could we go back to the previous uh, slide that you had on? Okay, now can you just see the orange there? Yeah. Uh, that guy there, okay. Um, now, there is a recently um, developed, uh, had to go ahead for that, what they call the Te Kofi Estate. And it's just across the road from our property with section sizes at 5,000 square. Some of these were sections were delayed to enable introduction of the uh, much more desirable 3,000 square, and they were live now. 
Uh, there's around 30 sections here, and I understand they are all sold or have contracts on them. They were gone in a very short amount of time. And once again, it shows that this area uh, is a very desirable uh, place to have. Um, this includes some show homes in there, where I guess um, yeah, uh, building companies have decided to show their homes off. Um, most houses are already built, and there's still some under construction. Within this development, um, slightly up to the, I guess, to the left of the orange, about midway through the orange and just to the left, um, this is where um, they've got the magnificent Saints Cafe. It's, a, it's an old church move from uh, Methodist Church, move from London Street. It's about to open um, in a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, it will also comprise of six light commercial shops um, and this would be supported and patronised by um, our proposed development. It's within five metres and um, recently um, five, minutes. five minutes walk from, from our property and any other proposed um, developments in the area will utilise these, um, these products. Now, could I have the, um, the Penn Beagle one up now, please? Which is, no, not that one, the next one. The next slide, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this one here. Okay. Um, this is it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, uh, okay. This is the Pen Beagle, which um, just late last year this became operative. It's up there in the in the red that you can see here. So our property that we're talking about is down towards the bottom of this picture. Uh, we've spoken to the agent, and these sections sold. Um, in very quick time, and we've spoken to a purchaser of one of these uh, properties. They have section sizes of 5,000 square and some slightly bigger than that, and these uh, 18 sections were sold within six weeks of being on the market, with backup or multiple offers on many of these. There's eight to 10 houses under construction at the moment, and they're going up pretty quick. The selling agent has said he has 50 more clients on his database looking for smaller, similar or smaller uh, block uh, sizes in this area. And he went on to say that smaller sections would be a more desirable size. He said there's quite a contrast of age groups that are interested in buying this property. But now where? Since they have all been snapped up in the Tikofoi area. Do we have enough live zone sections available in Tikofi? No. Are there too many live zone sections available in Tikofi? No. Is there almost enough live zone sections in Tikofi? The answer is no. Right now, do we have demand for live zone sections in Tikofi? Yes, we do. Respectful, respectable, decent people with settled families are the type of people attracted to these style settings. Tikofi Village is within seven kilometres from the base. There is also the new Hamilton to Auckland passenger rail service has just been introduced. That's six k's away. Tikofi is five k's away from the expressway, giving option to use or to avoid the expressway if you want to. It also makes an easy pathway to Auckland further north or indeed to the south. Mr. Chairman, you're going to end up wanting to move down here. <laughs> Us. <laughs> <laughs> I might convince you yet. Uh. Employment is provided by Hamilton City and surrounding towns. The increasing industrial development at Tirapa North, the Horatu and Northgate Industries and Freight Hub and the Port of Auckland development has met a number of new employees, many in management positions, are trying to source houses and homes and sections in this area. They are looking now and none are available. During these hearings, um, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we've seen plenty of graphs showing growth in desktop predictions, but local knowledge we believe is definitely a better indication as to what is needed. Could I go back to the first photo, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, this one. 
Uh, no, that one, the pen beagle's finished now. Uh, the first one, I think, that we put up a little bit of colour there. Oh, that's, what, that's the one that's showing on my screen. Is that not showing on yours? Uh, no one. This one here, that's fine. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and could maybe we could just highlight more the Stead Davis and the green area there. What do you mean by making it bigger? Slightly bigger if we can. There you go. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, our land is 11 hectares. You can just see the stead there. Um, yep. It's perfectly flat land. It's a billiard table. Mr. Singh, who's on Tikofi Road. Uh, you've got Mr. Singh's property about there. Um, it's four hectares of flat land. And Mr. Davis is, 10 he is nine hectares. All these properties are flat. They're lovely, free draining, and they all are connected by a council indicative road. Could I just get you to put your cursor on there, uh, Mr. Chairman? It'll run, start at the green. No, uh, yes. Run along there, through our, no, no. The indicative road. Yeah, the, it's an indicative road. Come there on. and straight up, exactly. Yep, thank you for that. Um, they are all connected by council indicative road, allowing easy access from Horatu Road dissecting our properties through to Tekofi Road. In all recent developments, no one has relied on reticulated services. They catch rain water in water tanks and they utilize modern sewerage systems. They're self-reliant. However, anyone purchasing these properties could place their dwellings in such a way so to create an option in the future should reticulated water or services become available in the short term. We are aware to an extent that the Metcalf property is exploring options. We would like to be open, we would be certainly be open to discuss with the council or Mr. Metcalf about a privately held or publicly vested package plant, which could be used to manage sewerage and wastewater. Um, there are three neighbors that I talk about um, on this road. We currently have a good working relationship with Mr. Metcalf. In an earlier submission, earlier part of the submission, we sought to have a neighboring property, which is 669 Horatu Road. Now that's the green area you can see down here, exactly. Um, we sought to have that property rezoned village zone. But during that time, much has evolved. And our understanding is that the owner is in advanced talks with the council to purchase this land to extend the current playing fields in Village Green, and they plans for the road, indicative road to go through there. We hope this has a good um, ending for them. To conclude, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we have three neighbours in unison. We're not reliant on services, we had, and we are starting to have combined discussions with surveyors and geotechnical engineers, and we are ready to pull the trigger on this much needed road and live zoning as indicated in the proposed district plan right now. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stead. Let's see how we go with um, questions. Uh, Ms. Gipp. Um, yes, thanks, Mr. Stead. Um, just, I just would like clarification. The part of the um, map with your name and the pink that's not your entire property, is it? You, your property goes down to State Highway 39, does it? No, it doesn't. No, no. Yes, uh, State Highway, no, no, it's just the pink. It's just, uh, yeah, it's where's just- your current, Where's your current house? Is that not where your current house is? No, it's more where the D, if you go to the D on Stead and just yes. up a little bit, oh, okay. Yeah, house kind of about there. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to get my bearings. Thanks very much. Yes. Okay. Yep. It's fine. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Stead. Uh, quite clear. Thank you. No questions. Mr. Fulton. Um, thank you, Mr. Stead. You made submissions uh, about the air park. Um, submission, didn't you, about the noise uh, boundary? 
Yes, we've been involved in a hearing given team. Yeah, I, I think you had because I was on that hearing. Okay, so you are really wanting to go to um, the um, the bigger lots rather than go into urbanised. Is that what I'm taking from your your submission? Commissioner, um, we, we're flexible there. Um, we have um, look, we would be prepared to one first thing do it in stages. Um, we are not, I guess, prepared to wait for the 10 to 30 year that we first read about. Um, and if there's options to bring that down to a, a much friendlier, user friendlier um, uh, year, so, you know, we, we'd be certainly happy to, um, to start negotiations on that. So the village zone is what you'd be hoping to have, is that? A mixed size, mixed size lots, I guess. Um, I, I guess what we're saying is we're not prepared to sit if it was going to be 10 to 30 years, either the uh, the village or uh, mixed size lots, I guess. There's a need now. Can you there's a need now, me? I think, to, um, yeah. What was that? Can you, can you just remind me of the um, Section 42 reports um, comment on your property? I just couldn't find it quickly. I believe um, the recommendation it's on page thirty-four. Oh, sorry. Okay, thirty-four. Right. Okay. I'll find that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That, that, that'll. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sedgwick. Um, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Steele. I think you're a wonderful advocate for um, to co mm. um, Just a question. The other. Um, avenues or uh, tree-lined avenues of um, <coughs> subdivisions, if you, you like, that you talked about uh, seem quite small, with, you know, 18 or 20 or something in them. Um, what would be the yield off your site? My rough figures say around about 50 of those combined sites. Is that what, what, you're, what you've worked it out at? Um, combined of the Where three... No, no, uh, round about that, I suppose, if it's village zone, yes, I guess, um, slightly more or more, uh, of course, if, if we can cut it down more, but village zone, I would guess close to 50. Right. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. Okay. Mr. Cooney? No, I've got no questions except, um, um, Mr. Stead, if the chairman moved down to your area, it could be a blessing for Auckland. <laughs> <laughs> It's very harsh. It's very harsh. But then, <laughs> be a, but then I'd have to become a chief supporter, and I just don't think I could stomach that. <laughs> anyway, I was being very flippant when I said pass, um, Mr. <laughs> it's certainly a very nice area. I certainly accept that. Um, I don't have any questions, though. Thank you. I think it's um, it's very clear. And just to summarise. Uh, in terms of Mr. Fulton's question, the Section 42A report is to uh, zone the land future urban. And that's on page 34, Section 4.8 of the 42A report. So thank you very much, Mr. Stead. That's um, very helpful and very well explained. Thank you. Which brings us to, um, I think, Ms. Brown and Mr. McNutt. I see there's two slots there, which I think relate to the same property, although there's two submission, uh, submitter numbers. So perhaps, um, Mr. McNutt, you can just explain the, the, the two submissions and whether you're going to present them in one or in two, in two pieces. But um, over to you to do that. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Just first of all, confirming you can hear me? Yeah, certainly yes. can. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to turn the volume down. I can hear you so well. <laughs> That's great. And um, so just confirming that um, the evidence that was submitted was in respect to um, all three submissions. And I have with me here today uh, Vanessa. And Colette is joining us from Australia. Yeah. Australia. Okay, very good. Are you there, Colette? Yes, I am. Yeah. Brilliant. 
Yeah. Um, so what, and then good morning to you all. Um, what we are proposing to do this morning is to keep brief to the point, um, evidence is read, uh, but before I summarize, uh, Colette will uh, give the panel uh, some context of um, our site and if Mr. Bell could please bring up the site as she does this. Can everyone see that? Thank you. Yeah, I can. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the property, our parents bought the property in horror two, it was probably around 50 years ago. We've been, my grandparents, my uh, father and my sister have been locals in the community for yeah, probably around 60 years. Um, the property originally was a rural um, property with grazing, it's grazing cattle and um, yeah, some sheep and everything. So, But our vision for the community was to have it rezoned to residential due mainly to the anticipated growth that Horror 2 is um, going to have in the few, next few years. Uh, the location yet yeah, for the community, housing for the industrial estate, um, the locality towards for the expressway, and yeah, just mainly for for providing housing uh, to for community reasons, and that's yeah, probably it really. Um, yeah, the main reason good. why, yeah. So. <clears throat> and and Claire and Vanessa went to school. Um, on the on the, the, the neighbouring property back in the back in the day, right? Yeah, we walked across. The walked across, there. yeah. So, just thought you'd give you some context in terms of the history of the site. Um, but to my summary, um, so I've obviously been commissioned from uh, Vanessa Collette in terms of their submissions. I wasn't involved with uh, their submissions, so I, I came into it um, post that. But we are in support quite clearly of the rezoning to residential. Um, we think it will be a good use of efficient land and it's within the village limits and it's in very close proximity to Hamilton. <laughs> we believe it is very compatible, essentially, given the existing school and the residential lifestyle present in this area. The school is right next door. The play centre joins the northern boundary of the site. Future residential development within my client's land is well situated to access amenities, including employment areas, proposed retail within the Tiawa Lakes plan change area and the adjoining business zones. There are opportunities with the redevelopment of the site to create new pedestrian and cycle connections with the school and adjoining land ownership. The school is within 300 metres of Tiawa Cycleway, provides for recreation and access north and south. The site is highly connected to the Hamilton City and the Horrington Interchange. The site is not subject to any current or proposed hazards. Any potential sediment or subsequent residual hazards can and could be managed through Section 106 of the RMA. And also there is a suitable wastewater infrastructure solution plan for this area, which is key. In terms of a strategic overview, it aligns with the Waikato Metro Spatial Plan and Future Proof. Uh, the vision for the Hamilton Waikato metro area is to be a highly livable and sought after place to live in New Zealand. The metro area, which encompasses Horror 2, will be a place where people can easily access employment, aka the industrial, education, health facilities, schools, and also efficient transport connections and great places. The rezoning of my client's land will support and essentially give effect to the metro spatial plan and its initiatives. Horato is earmarked through Waikato 2070 as a future specialised business and industrial area for which residential zoning and living is essential and compatible to support local employment. In terms of opportunities, we believe that with the Tiawa Lakes plan change area located close by, the additional land that's been rezoned um, will give effect and essentially contribute to uh, the vision of uh, what the, the Waikato Metro Spatial Plan is looking to achieve. Um, we also understand and anticipate suitable reverse sensitivity uh, standards and, and, and opportunities through the, the plan making process to ensure that um, reverse sensitivity is managed, uh, much like uh, when the WEX is, is put in, so setbacks and insulation methods. So we anticipate that and support that. 
Um, in terms of further opportunities to meet the Waikato housing supply is stated in the sector 42A. For example, uh, additional housing capacity is uh, required for between eight and a half and ten and a half households um, to support local uh, employment. Now, we're looking at a potential yield of 20 or 30 per hectare, which gives us somewhere between 112 and 168 lots on this site. Um, given my experience too, locally, um, with development that's happening uh, particularly south of Horatu, so we're talking about Radikari, talking about Rotatuna, um, there are infrastructure constraints already within these greenfield areas. So to meet housing supply, manage affordability, this is a site that can contribute from a, a broader Waikato scale. Um, now, we also believe that this site has development potential um, through the consenting process. Now, that is because there's several lengthy road frontages. It's got a large land area. It's capable of containing um, open space. It's got largely flat topography. Um, it's got obvious and legible pedestrian cycleway opportunities for connections. It's a traditional square, sort of rectangular shape, which provides opportunity for efficient use of land. Um, and what I mean by that is it's, it, it avoids uh, the likelihood of irregular shaped lots. Um, there's also a low number of adjoining landowners, in my opinion, which makes connectivity through adjoining neighbouring blocks more likely. Um, I've dealt with sort of the conversion of sort of the lifestyle blocks in an urban sense and when there's a lot of people involved, a lot of people around the edge, um, those opportunities uh, can slip away quite radically. So when I'm looking at this, in my opinion, I'm seeing uh, a good opportunity for, for legible connection, connections through to neighbouring blocks. Um, we obviously support the Section 42A recommendations um, and we think that the residential zoning of the site is uh, reasonable, it's logical, it's rational um, and it achieves the purpose of the RMA. Higher order objectives of the RPS, Waikato 2070. Um, we think the proposed, proposed residential zoning also gives effect to the MPSUD and will provide much needed housing capacity for the region. And that's the conclusion of what I have to say. We have to take questions. Thanks, Mr. McNutt. Let's see how we go with questions, Mr. Mai. Oh, no, no questions. Very clear, very concise. Thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? No, none from me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fulton. Yeah, no, I have no further questions, thanks. Ms. Gibb. Um, yes, just can you tell me what's the property used for at the moment? Is it farming? Farming, yeah. It's farming. Okay, thank you. No, uh, no further questions, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Did I ask you before? Sorry, if I did, I, my apologies. Mr. Cooney. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I've just got um, one question, and I... It may be my misunderstanding. The section 42A, have you got a copy of the section 42A report there, Mr. McNutt? I do. I just no, want to, it, and it's not in relation to your submission, but it's. You'll see, I'm, I'm referring to, if you've, got a, if you've got a copy there, it's on page 80. Uh, there's a map on page 80 that you'll see. Yes. yes. Can you, I just, I just want to be clear. I thought I understood where your property was. Can you just point the property out on the map that's on the screen? It's the, uh, it's the orange one, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. the one that's highlighted in red. That, that's what I thought. Well, if you look at that figure on page 80 of the section 42A report, the front of that property, which is denoted as area A, is that there's a submission requesting that it be zoned business. Am I, have I understood that correctly? Yeah, if you go to, I, I, I do know what you're talking about. If, you, if I refer to point 200, uh, paragraph 200. Yes. Is that, yes, I, I'm, I'm, well, I, I'm I, I, we can address that in due course. Yeah. But it's not your submission. No. And I just want to be clear what your that that's not a submission that's giving effect to anything that you have talked to other people about. Your your proposal is that this should be 
residentially zoned as per the notified proposed plan. Correct? That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to be clear because I was confused as to how come the submissions suggesting that your land should be rezoned to um, to something else. And it yeah, might be no, that's the point. I should ask just to be very clear about that. Yeah, what, I mean? the blue one. what was that? Um, the Sorry, Ms. Gibson. The blue part was going, my understanding was the business, um, yeah, which right. was the, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, no, we're just confirming the, the, the proposed um, business as opposed to the. So, the so as far cash. as you're concerned, as far as you're, you're concerned, we should ignore the black. As it relates to your property, okay. it, is not, it is not what we submitted on, what we intended, or what we want for the site. I, I, no, I just wanted to be clear. Very yes. good. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you both. And um, Ms. Brown, you're our first intercontinental um, <laughs> submitter, so um, you'll get Thank a you. metaphorical gold star for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all okay. very much. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> that brings us to the end of the submitters that we're due to hear from this morning. I just want to check, because we're quite well ahead of time, I just want to see if either uh, Mr. Delatour, Mr. Lester, on behalf of Mr. Van Dam and Mr. Lovell, or Council Holdings Limited folk, it doesn't look like. Yes, so we are. Oh, you are. Sorry. Yes, you yeah. are there. There you go. Sorry, my mistake. There you go. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I mean, we don't want to rush you or put you in, in an, any situation you don't want to be in. But if, if you're wanting to talk to us and ready to, um, that would be fine. But yeah. happy to leave. I'm happy to. I do, do feel a bit out of my depth with all these experts, but... I've just written a few notes in no particular order, but it's pretty much how I feel. Okay, well, if you're happy to proceed, we're um, yep. more than happy to hear from you now, but only if you're comfortable with doing it now. Okay, well, I'm Mark Dallator. Thank you very much, Mr. Dallator. Yep, 46 Jackson Street. I don't, I don't pretend to understand this process fully. Sorry, I'm looking away, but I'm reading from some notes I've got. But what I do understand, we will have our own agendas, not unlike a game of chess. And it looks like I have a chess master as a neighbor. <laughs> as for putting a culvert on a hand, sorry, we're over here. I've tried reading the reports and from what I can see, they mostly all suggest our property would make an ideal residential subdivision especially uh, as it's in the stock exclusion zone and 99.9% .9 of it's above any flood zone. So to me, it's, you can see from the pictures, it's on dry land. It's not the, high, it's not the highest land around, but it's, it's elevated, which is a nice contour. And then as for putting a culvert or a small bridge, across you know it's it's no more than a spring i think and it's no more than a meter wide and you know it doesn't seem a biggie to put a bridge or a culvert across something i mean look at the waikato river you just put a bridge across there for cyclists and it's nothing to put a bridge across a wet patch or culvert i mean um waterway so from what else i see when you look at all these maps it seems quite a coincidence that my neighbor is happy or residential subdivision, so long as he doesn't have to look at it. Yeah, I reckon it would be great if others had the opportunity to enjoy some of his views. Because when you look at it, if you look where his house is, it's just directly anywhere but where I look, basically. Which I don't blame him. Okay, back to the so-called wetland that my neighbour is going to devote the rest of his life to. Yeah. I'd say that's pretty fair after 80 years of farming and running stock on it and wishing continue this, which seems to be quite 
pod, considering his expertise, when you consider his proximity to the spring and the rivers. I reckon as part of any subdivision, the streams would benefit as they would be heavily planted and walkways made. So I reckon everyone would get to enjoy them. But at the moment, it's no more than a, a hand dug drain, right? I believe quite simply, my neighbor doesn't wish to overlook town and I don't blame him. But when you live so close to town and the need for housing is so great, it's always a very real possibility. I believe my land would make a great Subdivision. residential subdivision as it's not suitable for farming and it's on the edge of town. Yep, that's what I got. Salisbury, Salisbury Road would make a logical boundary between Narawaihi and Horatu. And with the new roundabout, it all makes sense. Anything else would seem short-sighted based on the size of the need. It would seem a great waste to miss this opportunity so one very influential man can maintain his outlook. I'd say this is very close to a conflict of interest, if not. I also see no practical or logical reason why my property shouldn't become residential. If in fact, if in fact, no, in fact, I think it would be a real asset to the town. And that's pretty much summing up how I feel. I know that's that's very clear. Let me just say at the at the outset, we we it doesn't matter who it is that's presenting to us, whether they're someone of you know Mr. Upton's um, history and and obvious um, knowledge and those sorts of things. It's all about the information that is put to us. You know, we we play the yeah. the, the the ball, not the man, and. Um, I just want to reassure you of that at the outset. We, you know, there's no favourites in, in what we're yeah. doing. We're simply listening to everybody's point of view, acknowledging that quite often there are differences of opinion, um, mm -hmm. but we don't give any more weight to, to somebody based on who they are versus who they aren't. So I just want to reassure you of that. I'd also say that the information that the council staff have provided by way of the what we're referring to as the section 42a reports they're recommendations to us only we're not obliged to accept them at all um, we are obliged to listen carefully to what it is they've based their views on as we are the submitters and everybody that speaks to us but i'd be very concerned if you went away today thinking oh because Mr. Upton's a, you know, a, an upstanding member of the community. He somehow gets special favours from us because he certainly doesn't. Yeah, I, I understand that. that point very clear. Yeah, but anyway, but yeah, I do understand with a plan change. I think step one is you recognise a need. So I think there's no argument of the need for residential land, right? And I think Mr. Upton in this case is a little bit more than just an upstanding member of the community. No, I understand the point that you're making. Did, yeah. Does um, does Miss Cannon want to say something? Looks like she might. If, if you I'm do, she's trying, keep, she's, she's, she's trying to keep me quiet. Yeah, tr I'm trying desperately to um, stop what? him from the voice of reason. voicing his personal opinions. Now, I uh, wrote our submission, and I understand that you have all read that. Um, yes, thank you. It was a bit long-winded. Um, we're not professionals. And obviously, we have, uh, there's personal gain to be made from us. So is there any chance that you could use the little aerial slider and show the land? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So what I'd like to, and also, now if you click on the flood zone, um, yeah, excellent. So if you'll see that, that our portion of the property there is, is really... Um, not in that. Yet the, the little um, stream, which we believe is, what is it? Oh, 99. I'm led to believe it's a spring. We believe it's a spring that know. runs through our property and comes around there. So we believe that that should have plantings and, and have a nice walkway through it anyway, so other people can enjoy it. Um, 
Now, yesterday we heard from uh, another neighbour just above us there, uh, Mr. Allen, John Allen. Now, I, I actually met them when I went to the open home for our property. They were walking around it. Now, I think it would be beneficial. At the moment, I know that council are recommending that a portion of our property stay as it was notified and the back portion um, be removed. Now, this is where our problem comes in. I understand that the, the reasoning for this is because it wasn't notified on the structure plan. I think it was in 2014. Um, but I think the need has changed dramatically from when that was written. Uh, and it's really problematic when you have a portion of your land that um, could be residential and a portion that will still be rural. Um, now, for one thing, um, the expense that's involved in subdividing. Now, if you're able to do it once, and then also, like we can work in with our neighbour, um, Mr. Allen, because the top portion of his land that backs onto us up there, honestly, it's absolutely stunning and it's very dry. And I understand rather than having to go down over, over the stream where it is, almost a flood zone, well, where it's said it's a flood zone, he can actually come through the short part of our, our property, the little line there, where there's a, a, a paper road that goes through to Solbury Road. And then there's another one up the side that's going to go, that goes down to sort of Great South Road there. So there's a number of different options for gaining access to this property and to the top yeah. of Mr. Allen's. So when you look at that, you wouldn't even be crossing the road. Um, no, you, and if you, if you zoom in closer to our property, the little wee bit that we, where we go over, yeah, exactly. Now if you use the scale, just right down in the corner here. Sorry, I don't have a pointer. I can't show you. But you can see the horse arena just by there is where it crosses the stream. Now it has a little culvert in it, and in the time that we have been there, that's never been covered, that's never flooded or anything. So simply the road could be along the high ground here. So I'm just suggesting that there are other options. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think if you look at any subdivisions around the country, like um, the sought after areas for us seem to be the higher ground where there's views. And um, also, I think it was Mr. Roberts mentioned that he thought that the ridgelines shouldn't be, shouldn't have houses on them, that it should be maintained in views. Well, I wonder if you realize that not very many people actually get to enjoy the views of the ridgeline because the town doesn't look at it. Um, Mr. Upton's property does look at it and a few around the back here. But in actual fact, at the moment, only a couple of old skinny cows get to enjoy the views up there. And I think it would be really nice um, if more got that opportunity. Mark has something else to say. So, and as far as that, looking at the ridge line from town, that boundary line between myself and the Stalin, that's the high ground. So once there's houses on the Stalin, you wouldn't even see my side from town. So I don't know. And there's the potential of access as paper road coming off Salisbury Road. If we use that paper road, uh, you just go down a bit on the mouse. Yeah, that, that's the one. I think you yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's two of them. Yeah, if you use one of those paper roads, we're not even crossing the stream. You know what I mean? And that gives us access to mine and Mr. Allen's. So we're not even. It does come here. Yeah, no, yeah. if we went up here. Yeah. Anyway, that's pretty much, we can go on and on about it, but just seems to make a great subdivision for me. I'd like to live there. <laughs> oh, that, that's pretty clear. Let's, um, yeah, let's see if there's any questions that the panel have for you. Um, Mr. Fulton? Uh, no, but I think obviously we need to have a site visit to understand the contours and, and so on of this region. So um, no, no questions at this stage, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sedgwick. Um, I have no questions, but I can see what you're passionate about. So you've made your point very well. Thank you. Mr. Mark. Yeah, you made your point exactly very well. Um, no questions. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Um, a site visit would be a great idea. Well, I'm happy, happy to meet you there. Thank you.
Ms. Ms. Good. Okay. Thanks for your time. We haven't finished yet. Ms. Good. Okay. I agree. I agree that a site visit would be um, very um, special to us. Thank you. Mr. Cooney. Um, just two things. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I, I endorse the chairman's comments that um, <clears throat> we look at this matter entirely on its planning merits, and that's what we've got to do. So um, just want to make that quite clear. Um, just you mentioned um, somewhere that you, in your evidence that you that part of your property is retained as rural. Which where, where's that? Where's that area up, up to the up the up the top there? It's the bit. Oh, I can't Thank show it on the screen. It's it's a crop. It's the it's the the boot of the. If you if you look if you say that looks like a boot. Yeah. It's the toe part of the boot. The the east the the corner is what the council forty two a report has recommended be retained as rural. Okay. No, that's not actually. Was more that's than that's there, not actually true. It's actually aligned through the narrow point. They've drawn a line. The whole area they've actually asked, not just that tiny little wee bit in the corner. Okay. We we can't no, actually it's, share. It's it's a bit where the cursor is now, a horizontal line across from there, as I yes. understand it, but from the ankle down. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, that's that's the bit right right I might not have explained it very carefully. Yeah, it's, it's not, not the toe. How many hectares no, 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 is no, it? No, it's the foot. I'm sorry. Did no, I say foot. toe? I meant foot. You said toe. I meant foot. foot. I apologize. It's seven hectares the whole property. Yeah. yeah. It's either the foot or it's the bit completely in front of Mr. Upton's house. And the rule of the You've, you've, you have made that point and it's not lost on, <laughs> on us. But the yeah, rural part is... Site visit would be great. All yeah, right. Look at it. Mr. Kenny? It's, it's, not a, it's not according to where his house is situated. It's, as I said before, it's about um, what, what is appropriate for, for rezoning this land. So, so I think we should just keep focusing on that and not, uh, not Mr. Upton. So um, is, that, is that land flat? <coughs> The, the foot. place that's been no. retained as rural. No. Um, is it? Hang is on. It's a, a gully area. Hang no. on. See, three quarters of it, you can drive a tractor over it, which makes it rolling. And there's about a quarter of it, which is a bit too steep for a tractor. Okay. So really steep. Okay. We'll, we'll have a look at it anyhow. We'll, we'll, yep. we'll, we'll have a site visit. So, okay, thank you. Thank no problem. You. Well, I don't have any questions. You've, uh, you've answered um, or you've addressed everything that uh, I would have asked you about. So thank you very much. And thank you for slotting in, um, in our pre-lunch session. At yeah, least it takes the pressure off you and you can make the most of your work. afternoon if you, or you can come back and listen to us <laughs> if you wish. Yeah. Hey, so, so this, thanks. sorry, the site meeting, will I be invited? No, um, oh. we'll need, uh, and the only reason we do that is is that we have the, the, the conversations around what we see and hear and so on and so forth is done in the hearing. And the site visit is simply for us to ground truth what we've heard. What we don't want to be in a situation of, as I'm, I guess you could appreciate it, if we were on Mr. Upton's property and spent the morning walking around with him, you'd say, well, what's he told me? What's he said? And so we make sure that everything that's said is in this transparent forum and the site visit that we do is is on our own the only thing that we'd say to that is if we need to get access um, we need to have a conversation with landowners about how that's done but we don't have our hands held while we're doing the site visit and it sounds fair mm. yeah i just like take, just when you look at it take in consideration the paper roads and the potential different access points because that's the real game changer yeah, well, I think yeah. understood, and we will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think um, we'll now adjourn for lunch until one o'clock, and we, we're due to hear from Mr. Van Dam and Mr. Lovell, and then following that, Council Holdings. Um, and that will bring our day to an end once we've done that. So you need to close this session completely, log off. There's a separate meeting request or a separate um, link for this afternoon session. So thank you everybody, we'll adjourn now till one o'clock.